Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming to our two-day symposium on Henry Winston, celebrating the 50-year anniversary of the publication of his book, Strategy for a Black Agenda. We have a beautiful program together in this very important time in the need for ideological clarity and struggle. And uh, I'd like to kick us off by passing it over to Ransom so he can pour some libations. Everyone who has died or made transition is an ancestor. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Therefore, I will do an ancestral prayer, and at which time I will pour my basin. I give praise to the omnipotent creator. I give praise to the light and energy of the four directions. I give praise to the light and energy of the air I breathe, the water which sustains life, the fire that cleanses the earth, and the earth that holds me up. I give praise to all the honored ancestors who are seated at the feet of the Creator, having completed their work on this earth. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of Africa and the Caribbean. I give praise to my ancestors who died in the middle passage. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of North America, whom the Native Americans call Turtle Island. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of Central America. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of South America. I give praise to my ancestors whose blood runs through my veins and yet their names are not known. I give praise to my ancestors who walk with me, who look for me, who guide and protect me. Spirits, I welcome you. I offer you water to purify you of the bondages of your life. spirit mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and friends to remember me in your travels. Protect me, guide me, assist me and all members of our family living and dead. I am in need of your assistance at all times to overcome challenges and obstacles with money, health, employment, recovery, wisdom, Musical ecstasy, spiritual ecstasy, and my own mortal progress. I thank you for your guidance. 
I thank you for your intercession, good spirits. Good spirits. Carry my prayers with you to the feet of the Creator. Fill my heart and my mind with perfect peace and resolve. I thank you for bringing the perfect solution in the perfect way at the perfect time for the best of all involved. I say. And now I need you to loudly call out anyone that you have loved that has made transition. It could be a family member. It could be a, a community member. It could be a community hero. Your choice. Cynthia Vassar. Ashe. John Jock Desilene. I said. No fine. I said. Helen Checker. I said. Harry Tubman. Mm. I said. Francis Bernard. I said. Munchie. I said. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I said, Nat Turner, then Mark VC. I said, I said, okay, for all the ancestors, the people who in our minds are nameless that served us. The good spirits that serve us, we thank them. I say, hotel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ransom. Uh, so we'll get. Um, today's uh, uh, program started um, by reading the vision statement, and I just wanted to mention that um, like we are um, we are doing this symposium um, not in a vacuum, but in a world um, deeply in a state of crisis. Um, and I hope the vision statement uh, speaks for itself. U.S. imperialism and its Zionist puppets have brought humanity close to a third world war. The Palestinian people and their martyrs, men, women, children, and the elderly are contributing mightily to the dual projects of anti-colonial and anti-white supremacist liberation and for world peace. These are unprecedented times. Tectonic shifts in the movements of humanity are unfolding in front of our eyes. The negative peace of a unipolar neo-colonial world order led by the West, a Pax Americana as it were, which our generation became adjusted to, is becoming a thing of the past. President Biden's most recent speech to the Congress has called for financing war not only against Russia, but also the Palestinian people and the broader Middle East, including Iran, Syria, Saudi Arabia. His speech promised future wars against China and North Korea. The ruling elite have lifted the veil, revealing that their only agenda is war. Whatever moral legitimacy they had in the world has crumbled. The overwhelming majority of the world's people categorically reject its war agenda, choosing to break away from its um, web of political, economic, and ideological control. The call to war exposes the bankruptcy of the ruling class, which has no vision for a future world view of the American people. Homelessness, poverty, unemployment and underemployment, drug epidemics and crime ravage every major city and widespread parts of America. Increasing numbers of the youth slip further into self-degradation and nihilism, 
unable to imagine a future worth fighting for. The depth of the from the depth of the domestic political crisis is perhaps more starkly seen in the fact that more than 40% of the population do not vote. Mm -hmm. The upcoming election will be fought on the question of war, peace, and the economic well-being of the people. We are approaching a moment of reckoning for the establishment to remain unalterably committed to the triple evils of racism, poverty, and war. At the same time, the American people are war-weary and more anti-war than ever. They are joining hands with world humanity in the effort to build a lasting and positive peace. They aspire to create a peace economy centered on the human rather than profits from endless wars. Today, this is the foremost imperative for living dignified and purposeful lives. History teaches us that in times such as these, a ruling class in crisis is desperate to maintain its legitimacy with new forms of control. Um, it is prepared to go to any length to thwart a people's struggle for peace and genuine democracy. And yet the world has moved far beyond the time when the scientific pursuit of knowledge to change the world lay in the hands of a few. Today, the masses of humanity are prepared to make their contribution to the struggle to democratically transform the world. At the center of this struggle is the struggle for ideas. The ideological struggle to win the future must draw on lessons from history and be rooted in the concrete conditions of today. <laughs> With this aim, we commence on this two-day symposium studying the life, legacy, and thought of one of the most original thinkers of America, Henry Winston. Henry Winston was the chairman of the National Board of the CPUSA from 1966 until his death in 1986. He was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, in the heart of the segregated South after the defeat of Reconstruction. Growing up under racist terror and extreme poverty, he embodied the life world of the black proletariat. The options left to a young Winston were the life of unending misery and degradation or a life in struggle. The uplift of the dignity and decency in the lives of the most oppressed would be his life's work. And he held that knowledge of the world was indispensable to struggle. As he would say, we drink from the fountain of knowledge from whatever source and use it for social advance. Winston studied the world through active engagement with various forces involved in changing it. He came into contact with the Young Communist League through his work with the Unemployed Council of Kansas City, fighting for the army of unemployed that was rapidly growing during the Great Depression of the 30s. He joined the efforts to defend the freedom of the Scottsboro boys who were on trial for the unpardonable crime of being black. By the age of 25, he was a National Organization Secretary of the YCL and a member of the National Board of the CPUSA. His study of politics, philosophy, history and economy naturally led him to the science of Marxism-Leninism at the International Lenin School in the Soviet Union, which was attended by world revolutionary figures such as Joseph Tito, Deng Xiaoping and Ho Chi Minh. He developed close relations not only with revolutionary figures in the Soviet Union, but also in the people's, um, but also in the anti-colonial movements in Africa <coughs> and its leadership, in particular in the People's Republic of Congo, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, the Communist parties of Sudan and South Africa. He saw the world communist movement as the leading force for peace and democracy in the world, and Marxism-Leninism as a general theory to understand and guide the revolutionary process. At the same time, Winston saw the revolutionary process in America to be a part of the world revolutionary process, albeit a unique part. His study of W.B. Du Bois, especially Black Reconstruction in America, allowed him to fundamentally ground the struggle in America in the centrality of the Black proletariat. The Black proletariat was not simply the most oppressed, but constituted the vanguard of the revolutionary process. At every stage in America's history, while the ruling class had fortified its political control through new forms of attack on the working class, the black struggle has furthered the cause of democracy and class emancipation. Armed with Du Bois' special theory of the class struggle in America and Lenin's general theory, Winston works out a revolutionary synthesis in theory and practice for the science of social change. He emphatically asserts that the black struggle is not a thing in itself but forms the basis for principled unity for, for the world movement from the age of imperialism to the age of humanity. 
not only does Winston deploy a revolutionary science to further the broad democratic struggle, but he must be seen as a scientist who furthers scientific knowledge. At a time when countless freedom fighters, it is Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and Winston himself, who were persecuted by McCarthyism, he strove tirelessly to elevate the science of Marxism-Leninism to the changing concrete realities in America. His centering of the black worker in the class struggle, while at the same time fighting endlessly for a united working class, changed the very ways that the racist, um, that the anti-racist and anti-monopoly struggles were thought of. Winston connects the anti-slavery and anti-monopoly struggles and the chief theorists Frederick Douglass and Marx and Lenin and Du Bois to show that the black proletariat was the advance guard in the struggle against racist monopoly capital. Strategy for a black agenda and his subsequent work Class, Race and Black Liberation shows the full scope of Winston's thought and his working out of a scientific synthesis indispensable to the struggle in America. It shows a dynamic mind that was rooted in the concrete black struggle, but international in outlook. Winston saw the essential oneness of the world, a oneness necessitated by a global capitalist economy and neo-colonial war agenda and the struggles against it. The Russian Revolution, the anti-colonial movements of Asia and Africa, the world communist and peace movements against imperialism, and the Black Liberation Movement were all distinct in the strategy and form. However, they shared the essential unity of fighting different stages of the same capitalist system, operating through white supremacy, colonialism, or neocolonialism. The basis <coughs> for principled unity between Black America and neocolonized Africa was not a skin strategy, but a common imperialist enemy <coughs> and a shared future in peace, democracy, and socialism. Armed with this clarity and vision, Winston exposed the various and varied ideological currents of neo-pan-Africanism, cultural nationalism, and Maoism for what they were, ideas that ultimately obscured imperialism and stand in the way of a united struggle against it. Today we live in times very different from Winston's. The rising tide of neo-colonialism is today at a stage of crisis, with most of Africa and West Asia breaking away from the West's orbit. Neither are the American people where we were. The nation has been fundamentally changed by the black freedom movement of the last century and by the leadership and vision of Martin Luther King. It has laid the grounds for yet another revolution, the fourth American revolution, which completes the radical revolution of values that King demanded. It contains the seed for the emergence of a new American people. Henry Winston's thinking offers a scientific basis for this emergence a new people who are more black than white mm -hmm. and centered on the black proletariat and his monumental contributions. Mm -hmm. This moment in history is ripe with possibilities of a philosophical shift from the logic of imperialism toward a new state of humanity and science is indispensable to this transition. We speak of science in its broadest sense as the method for advancing knowledge and seeking truth. As such, science is inseparable from its revolutionary purpose of changing the world and revolutionary times call for a qualitative leap in science itself. Today, at a time when science is weaponized by the ruling class to serve its own agenda, it is up to the people to recapture the revolutionary spirit of science mm. and free from the dogma and irrelevance to ordinary lives. This call for a reappraisal of science itself, as the Indian scientist, scholar, and freedom fighter D.D. Kosambi said, Science is the cognition of necessity. Mm. Thus we see science and freedom as inseparable parts of the movement of humanity. The Saturday Free School organizes this two-day symposium to study Henry Winston's mind and develop his science for our times. In this moment, youth and children must be convinced that there is a sky and a future worth fighting for. Mm. We call on the youth and children of our nation to join the youth and children of Palestine, for it is they who will bring the future into being. And the solidarity of the youth and children of these two peoples, Palestine and America, is an act of revolutionary love. Mm. It is the only way out of this moment of intense crisis to forge out a moment of clarity and be part of the forward movement of humanity. And thank you.
Um, so now we we'll have the documentary screening, which uh, like we have been working on uh, for a couple of years, and then um, like very recently for the last couple of months. So I'll first ask Emil to introduce the documentary that he had prepared um, two years back, and uh, then and then I'm going to invite Purva to come. Up. Good morning. Good morning. Well, um, I'm here to introduce this uh, interview documentary that I was um, thankful to be <clears throat> a part in editing and crafting about two years ago, I think, when we had a, a symposium honoring his life. Um, I found this uh, from uh, the Te Tenement Library, the Robert F. Wagner uh Labor Archives at NYU, which was posted to Vimeo, so if anyone wants a full interview, you can watch, it's about four hours long. Um, but um, I think, you know, to, to just continue on to what uh, Shambhartha was saying, is we are living in revolutionary times, yeah. and so um, it's important that we are able to look to revolutionary luminaries um, and examples uh, to learn from, and that's can be a difficult thing to to uh, deal with in, in the lives that we live. And we want to be able to just strive for an education, and Henry Winston would be the first person to say, education for whom? Education for which class? Um, and that's a big part of the dynamic that we can't avoid right. in this moment of crisis that we're in. Um, and so um, as, as uh, inspiring as you know, Karl Marx and Lenin and Francis Fanon, all these other figures are, and, and I don't take anything away from them, we do have a tradition here that's particular for our moment in our modern time and a, and a figure who, who, who shows that even though someone like a Henry Winston, who was denied a formal education in this country, denied a lot of things that, that uh, I think we take for, for granted as, as, as citizens, he's still able to strive for that revolutionary education that's required to change society for the better. Um, and still see a light through it all. You know, he, he, he's, I mean, you'll see it in the interview, he, he speaks in a way that's still very clearly um, positive and optimistic, despite all of the, uh, the tragedies and bonds that he was constricted to in this society. I don't want to go on too long, um, but, but I just, I think it's very important that we look at these figures in the light that they are able to give us moving forward. Um, and uh, I'll give it to Porba, who added more to the documentary as well. Yeah. I'm not going to speak for very long also. I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about why we chose the parts that we chose to put in the documentary because, I mean, the entire four-hour thing is, is just so beautiful to watch. And it's hard to decide what you don't want to keep, but I think we wanted to show how beautiful he was and how humble. And you can see that this humility comes from being rooted in the people and being close to the working class. And you know the way he talks about coming to communism and the Communist Party, it was not a dogmatic thing for him. It really, to him, it was an instrument of the people's struggle, a way to bring them together, a way to actually forge unity among the black and white workers, which he realized was the only way to struggle against a criminal racist system could be fought. And like Emil was saying, I think it's important to hear what he says about education and knowledge and how he describes being trained in the Marxist-Leninist tradition, how it created in him a hunger to study, to know the world, and made him realize, like Shambhartha was saying in the vision statement, that knowledge and education is indispensable to the revolutionary process. Now, this is something that all young people should hear mm -hmm. because it gives hope. It makes you realize that change is possible, that unity is possible, and in our times, through our action. But then you see that Winston is not known. Every effort has been made to erase him or relegate him to the past, like he has nothing to do with the future. Right. But that is why in the, in, you know, just in this version of the documentary, we wanted to put historical photographs and clips from the time he belonged to, to show how large he was, how close he was to the world revolutionary movements and their leaders and how large his vision was. And we also wanted to show how the ruling class punished him for it. And 
they tried to break him they persecuted him you know he was in prison treated in an inhuman way they tried to break him but they couldn't he emerged stronger and even more committed to the people's struggle and i just want to end by saying that watching him and hearing him gives you a glimpse into the future the future that must be and the future that we have to struggle for and we are hoping that through this documentary he comes alive to show us the path towards it thank you
that last song got me really teary. Um, I would like to thank uh, Emil and Purva for putting this together. And it's it's a shame that there, there exists so little of such a beautiful man yeah. with such a beautiful vision. Um, and now that we have seen what he looks like and his and heard his thoughts and are familiar with, the, with his ideas, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Anthony Montero to, who has worked alongside Winston for 15 years to give us a little bit of an insight into this man that you have just witnessed. And um, I too would like to thank Emil and uh, Purba and Shantanu and Sambarta and others for putting this documentary together, drawing upon a four hour interview where unfortunately the interviewer sought to obscure the beauty which they brought forward through their editing and their humanism. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> no, 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 please. Jake, I can handle this. Um, what you saw was an extraordinarily beautiful human being. And what you saw was exactly who he was. Uh, let me just uh, say a little bit about the meter and texture of the way he spoke. First of all, as he said, he was from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He was a man of the Black South. Mm -hmm. This is very important because you have to understand what he heard as a child growing up. The way his mother and father <coughs> talked, the way his uncles talked, mm -hmm. That is the language of the black proletariat. Mm. That way of talking in and of itself is discriminated against. You'll often get black folk who will attempt and do everything they can not to sound too black. Mm. <laughs> Because to sound too black means that in school uh, you'll be marginalized as not intelligent. You stand up in a court and you talk too much like a black person and a black southerner, you're discriminated against. So the black voice is discriminated against even up to this day. So Winston spoke <clears throat> as a black man, mm. and he never tried to be anything other than what he was. But if you listen to his voice, and that is the way he spoke, there is a poetic meter there. Uh, at some time, it would be useful 
for us just to study the poetics of his voice. But then it is the poetics. <clears throat> it's very emotional. Mm -hmm. Of the sorrow songs. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that he never forgets the enslaved. He never forgets the special and cruel oppression of black folk. It's not just in this interview, because when he talks about the party, which is a mass organization of people coming from many backgrounds, many immigrants, many uh, native to America, and they had been brought up not like Winston had been brought up. Their way of thinking was pretty much grounded in the influences of white supremacy and the dominant ideology of the nation. But what Winston said, and this was true in his life, and I saw it myself, that people had to be ideologically remade. And that would occur through a combination of study, he believed in study and education of the people, and action. He always emphasized these two things. Uh, the other thing that is so impressive, and, and this was the way he was, I, I know when uh, we would have meetings and that was all the time, he would plan, he would, and he would uh, operate at the highest level of collectivity. He considered this to be the essence of democracy, what he would call inner party democracy. And those standards, he felt, should apply to unions, to churches, to community organizations, that democracy was the involvement of everyone, irrespective of whether they were highly educated or uneducated. Uh, they should be involved. One of the things that was stood out about him uh, was this idea to encourage people who had very little education mm -hmm. to speak up, right. to learn to speak, mm -hmm. not be afraid to speak, not be um, ashamed of yourself if you are black and don't speak like white people talk. Mm -hmm. And most black people don't, by the way. But to encourage them to speak because he felt that there could not be democracy without the people, without the working people, without the black proletariat. He believed in the party as an instrument of the political struggle of the people. As he said, he did not conspire to do anything. A conspiracy is something underground. Mm -hmm. right. He believed in democracy, so he believed in the airing of all views mm -hmm. yeah. of the political struggle. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he did not like about what we call bourgeois or capitalist democracy is that thought is for sale. Mm -hmm. Speech is for sale. That if you have money or if you're connected to people with money or power, you have speech. 
But if you don't have it, you're silenced. So he believed in the fullest development of democracy as a condition for the people achieving power. The people must know, the people must debate, the people must be given the opportunity to think and to know. And that is a condition of democracy. And that's why it would always make a difference between bourgeois democracy and democracy of the people. Bourgeois democracy is the democracy of a few. Mm -hmm. Rights for the rich, rights for those who are educated, but for the great mass of people. Do what you're told. We set up the voting time, you come and vote. Mm -hmm. You don't have anything to say about who the candidates are. The candidates can tell you anything and there is no accountability. That is not democracy. So he was not a conspirator at all. He was the very opposite of it. And of course, you know, in a communist party, there are many people who will uh, take on the stereotype that they've been given. So a lot of people I know in my generation would join the Communist Party and the vision that they had of what they were joining in many instances was that which had been given to them by the enemies of the Communist Party. So the hard work of learning what it is and what it means to be a communist, uh, many people thought they could leap over that. Mm. Uh, many people felt that all they had to do was read a work by Marx or Lenin uh, and be smarter than everybody else in the room, and that made them the best communist. Uh, the very opposite was the case. Now. Um, I guess a couple of few other things I'd like to say about Winston. Uh, this question of the black question. You have many people then and now who would say, well, Henry Winston wrote a book, Strategy for a Black Agenda. And they said, well, why didn't he write a book, Strategy? for a class agenda. Mm -hmm. But you see, if you unravel it, what does that reveal? Mm -hmm. Then and today, because there are many communists who never read the book, were not interested in the book. And while they didn't say it openly, uh, felt that Henry Winston was not talking about the class struggle. Had they read the book, they would have understood his expansive nature or understanding of the class struggle. And this is a big problem because most people, including most leftists, most liberals even, would say that the class struggle is pretty much identical to the trade union struggle. Mm -hmm. That the class struggle is about the majority of the working class who are white. You can hear that today. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna give any examples of it, maybe you can ask me a question. What Winston understood, and this is the concept of the centrality of the struggle for black liberation. I want to underline that. The centrality of the struggle for black liberation, which in essence meant the centrality of the black proletariat. If you don't get that right, there is no class struggle. There will be strikes. 
and there will be victories, mm -hmm. temporary though they be, mm -hmm. but never the full political development of the class struggle and the political realignment of the nation away from monopoly capitalism, mm -hmm. imperialism, and racism mm -hmm. towards a new democracy. Now, Winston assumes the chairmanship of the Communist Party in 1966. As you saw, he was blinded in prison. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will tell you up front, he never talked about himself. Even if you look at the documentary, he was asked the question, and that's why he addressed it. There was a purposeful, willful, intentional neglect of his health. He went blind in one eye and they allowed the tumor to persist, and he went blind in the other eye. Uh, he was eventually released after six years of an eight-year prison at Terre Haute in Indiana Federal Penitentiary. And I, I didn't remember that he did his time in prison alongside of the great communist Ben Davis, the black communist. They did their time together um, but he went blind, but he never, I never heard him talk about himself and his own situation in terms of his sight. And he had this thing that he said, I've lost my sight, but not my vision. And that was real. He continued to think, continue to struggle. And when I say struggle, I'm not just talking about the external forces, but the struggle within the party itself. This is hugely important because if there can't be an ideological advance contingent of the people, it makes it very difficult for the people to fight. That doesn't mean that the, quote, Communist Party dictates or uh, becomes this uh, uh, performative agency where I'm going to show the rest of the left that I'm uh, the most advanced in the left. You, you, have you ever experienced that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the type of uh, stereotypical, mm -hmm. quote, communism usually associated with Trotskyism and other ultra-leftists. Because what Winston believed, that in order for the great political realignment to occur, there had to be the united front of the people, the coalition of the people. And he felt, and I think it is accurate, that the two pillars well, the black liberation struggle, the struggle of a people against national, racial, and class oppression. This people uniquely situated in the history of this country with a unique and special understanding of this country was a vital necessity for progress. But on the other side, you need it the working class as a whole. It is that alliance, that unity, that he saw as the bedrock of the defeat of chattel slavery and would be the foundation of the defeat of monopoly capitalism. <clears throat> and therefore he writes this essay called From the Anti-Slavery to the Anti-Monopoly Coalition, where he says, that in effect, that what Marx saw could only be practical if combined with what Frederick Douglass saw. Mm -hmm. Of course, for many, this is, you've gone too far now. 
how can you take a former slave, brilliant though he was, and put him on the same level of a PhD in philosophy who had written a great text on political economy, Das Capital, how could you say that Frederick Douglass was the equal of Karl Marx? Or that W.E.B. Du Bois was the equal of Lenin? And Winston said both. Because he understood that science did not end with theory. It required a practice guided by concrete conditions of the anti-slavery struggle, which was an epic struggle, an epic struggle, without which democracy in Europe and the anti-colonial struggle which was to follow could not occur. This is misunderstood. This was not just a question of freeing slaves in the United States. This was a question of world historic significance. Thus, Frederick Douglass is a figure of world historic significance. One could even go further. The Russian Revolution and the freeing of the Russian peasantry from czarist oppression owes a great debt to black folk and the anti-slavery struggle. And that is the case also for Du Bois and the anti-imperialist struggle of the 20th century. You know, um, it is easy to dismiss a Henry Winston. And if you look at the four hours of that documentary, what the interviewer is doing is, in effect, trying to dismiss him and trivialize him. Well, that's the color line. Winston knew the color line in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He knew it in Kansas City, Kansas. He knew it in New York. He knew it in the Communist Party. Different form. The color line associated with who knows and who doesn't know. Who has a complex, sophisticated understanding and who is just talking, as they often say about black folk, from their gut experience. Mm -hmm. We cannot know things on a higher theoretical, philosophical mm -hmm. level. But now 50 years later, and we are very fortunate to have in the city of Philadelphia a Saturday free school, which we fight very hard to maintain and develop, made up mainly of young people. Mm. It wasn't always this way. <laughs> The median age, if you go back a few years, was about 40 or 43. <laughs> and many of them got old and went into retirement. Maybe they were already in retirement. Uh, but uh, a new generation, and these are kind of what you see here, came to the fore and decided that there was a fierce urgency of right now. Mm -hmm. That was not just about reading books and talking. That ideas had to become a political material factor in the lives of the people of Philadelphia. That what we know, what we study, what we believe is of value far beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we believe that. But I dare say there's not an organization in the city of Philadelphia, probably within 
United States, which would have so honored this great man. You're not going to find it. And I have to say, even for what goes for the Communist Party. And I will say to them, you trivialize and make Henry Winston invisible at your own peril. Winston said at the end, and Shantanu asked that I address this, and then you can ask me some questions. Henry Winston said the Communist Party would always exist. It, was, it would exist as long as the working class exists. Mm -hmm. This is a complex thought. And it should not be taken merely uh, literally. What is Henry Winston saying? He is saying that the ideas that will lead to the liberation of working people in the first instance, the black proletariat who were enslaved, as long as that exploitation and oppression exists, there will be a resistance to it. And in the era of the great crisis of the system of capitalism in the stronghold of world capitalism, the United States, which is in the greatest crisis of its history. The ideas of the liberation of the people and of the working class will take hold among younger generations. What Winston was saying is made manifest by what we are doing today. The fact that the ruling class could not destroy him testifies to the truth of what he was saying. This uh, interview was done in the early 1980s. As you know, he died in 1986. And it's almost as though he were talking to us right now. You see his kindness, you see his generosity. He was a man not just of commitment at the level of the intellect, but the commitment of the heart. A lot of people say you're just born with that empathy. Perhaps in a certain way, you might be just born with it, but you have to nurture it. Mm -hmm. You have to develop it. And the development of the heart is as important as the development of the head. Mm -hmm. And those people who want to be, quote, super intellectuals, I would suggest to them mm -hmm. that you confine yourself to the academy. Right, right, right because the people need people who not only know but feel. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one other thing I wanted to say. Um, he was a good man, a great man that never stopped being good. A great man that never stopped being good. He didn't have what you could call a Napoleonic complex. That is, that I'm great and I can do whatever I want to do. That there are no boundaries, moral or otherwise. Henry Winston always adhered to moral boundaries. That to be a revolutionary meant to be moral to care about people, to care about the small things in people's lives, such as your health. Mm -hmm. And even though he was suffering with this growth, that
that blinded him, that would ultimately kill him. He never talked about it. I didn't know what had happened. I was a little shy to ask, you know, because I'm young and they're older. But he was always concerned about everybody else's self. When Angela Davis was imprisoned, and he, let's be real, was the political mastermind of the movement to free Angela Davis, both in this country and internationally. It was Henry Winston. Uh, just a small thing. I remember hearing about a debate within the top political body of the Communist Party when Angela was arrested. And one comrade said, we must defend Angela Davis as a communist. Mm -hmm. Sounds really revolutionary, doesn't it? Oh, that would have gotten her killed. Winston said uh, emphatically, mm -hmm. we will not. He's got to be tough. His declarative voice at this point, we will not. We will defend her as a black woman communist. Mm -hmm. That small nuance made all the difference in the world. Because whether the person who made the statement about we're going to defend her as a communist, and this is so-called revolutionary, and a lot of people say, well, this is going back to the 1930s and George Dimitrov who stood up to the Nazi trial and all of that. But Winston knew this was not the 1930s, nor was it Europe. This was 1970s United States, where black people had been enslaved, where there was no equal justice for black people. And to free this woman would require more than good lawyers, a great political strategy that could unite the world behind her. Mm -hmm. But this nuance comes out of what I wrote about in this article in Avant Garde, a black proletarian imaginary. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the way racism operates in the lives of black people, you cannot make the right decisions about black people. Mm -hmm. And this is why Winston would always say, can you accept black leadership? We say it in party yeah. meetings. Can you accept black leadership? Mm -hmm. And at this late date, mm -hmm. you take leaders like Du Bois or you take Martin Luther King, you take Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson becomes a singer, yeah. and not a political leader, not a scientist. Uh, du Bois was only interested in race, meaning only interested in the black population. Henry Winston could never rise to the level of white leaders of the Communist Party because he was only concerned with a strategy as a, for, for a black agenda mm -hmm. without reading the book. So, um, but the other thing, and then I end here, believe me. <laughs> Many people are more interested in popularity than they are in principle. Mm -hmm. You know, and popularity is a fleeting thing. You can be popular at one period and uh, be uh, forgotten in another. Most of our politicians and intellectuals uh, want to be pop stars. Many of the black ones model themselves upon hip-hop artists. Winston felt that there's a difference between an electoral majority and a revolutionary coalition. The politician who runs for office wants to get a majority of the votes temporary thing. Right. 
a revolutionary wants to win the long game, mm -hmm. to lay the foundation in politics and ideas and culture that gives the people the tools that they need to liberate themselves, and hence a revolutionary coalition, which is not necessarily a majority, but a decisive strategic part of the people. And that was his politics. I'll stop there. I'll be taking a break for lunch. Should we have questions, Shantanu? Um, does anybody have questions about the documentary or uh, about what Doc said? Um, you can ask them now or you can also catch them at lunch. Not when you leave. At some point. Mm. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> Uh, in Winston's book, uh, uh, for Black America. In Winston's book, he uh, talks about Pan Africanism, and he talks about the various forms of Pan Africanism uh, expressed by Garvey, expressed by Du Bois, expressed by others like Kwame Ture. What is the relevance of Pan Africanism today, and how would Winston define that? Well, I wanted to say one thing. You know, some people would say, well, Tony, uh, Henry Winston would not say what you're saying. For example, I've taken a position that we must defeat the Biden government no matter what it takes. Dangerous war administration, the most dangerous in the world and in the history of the United States. colonial settler states and the Portuguese colonies. To break the hold of neo-colonialism on the African continent, you had to undo the direct colonialism in Southern Africa. Well, now the direct colonialism in Southern Africa has been undone. But neo-colonialism persists. However, what Winston did not see and could not have accounted for in his time is this vast and deep crisis of neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. Hence, pan-Africanism, the unity and solidarity of the black struggle and by implications, the entire people's struggle with the struggle against neo-colonialism and direct colonialism and settled colonialism on the African continent. So Pan-Africanism today assumes a different quality, a different significance politically than it did in 1973. We are facing a crisis of neo-colonialism. Africa 
is coming forward as a major player in the reconfiguration, what we call the Afro-Asiatic reconfiguration of the world. So Pan-Africanism must operate within this political moment. That's the way I would put it. I hope I answered that. I came in a little late, so I... this on the front end, but how did you come to, first of all, meet Henry Winston? Did, did I did you address, address that? I didn't address oh, that. So how, how, did, how did you come mm -hmm. to meet him and, and befriend him? Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I met him before I was in the Communist Party. And I met him in Chicago, and he, this was around 1969, a couple of months before the assassination of Fred Hampton. And there had been a number of us in different parts of the country who had been studying Marxism, and had been studying Marxism through uh, Soviet books, and were pretty much pro-Soviet because of the role of the Soviet Union in supporting liberation in Africa. Uh, and so Winston asked if he could meet with us, some coming from Chicago, we're coming from Philadelphia, others from New York, and then of course the people in Chicago. And, and that's the first time I met him. And it was like he was, just like he was there. And I recall a number of things he said, but one of the things I remember most of all is his reference to Fred Hampton. Mm. And he referred to him as this brilliant young black man, mm. Fred Hampton. Mm. A couple of months later, if not a month later, Fred Hampton was dead. Um, that's my first meeting or encounter with him. And frankly, I didn't know what to make. You know, like any young person, you don't know what to make of an older man, you know, especially an older black man uh, and um, a leader of the Communist Party. And, you know, you, you have all kinds of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Is he really the chairman of the Communist Party or is he just put up there? Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? I think you understand what, what I'm saying, Wilmer. And, but more than anything, he listened to us, but you saw his heart. Mm -hmm. And this is something enduring about my encounters with him, his heart, mm -hmm. his empathy, his moral decency. You know, he was not talking at us, talking down to us. He was listening to us because he wanted to know where black youth were going. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I I joined the party, and I remember I wrote this article. And I think this is what made him think about me or got got his attention. I wrote this article. I gave a speech. I was invited to the Marxist Center in New York. I think I was about twenty three or twenty four, maybe twenty. And I gave a speech on Trotskyism, racist voice in the left. And uh, I look at it today, it's okay. But for then, it was uh, unusual. And then a young black man. And so he wanted to know who I was. And, um, you know, he, he, would, he would, and I don't want to make a big thing, he would always refer to me as the prodigal, mm. which did not do a lot for me among those who were more interested in, you know, shining themselves So here. But anyway, he wanted to get to know me, and uh, then I ran for Congress on the Communist Party here in Philadelphia. You know, and being young, you don't 
you don't have a, as much fear of doing anything. Mm -hmm. So he's, I guess he saw that. And uh, then uh, I'm certain it was his connivance that got me to head a delegation to the Soviet Union for the Komsomol Congress. Komsomol was the Young Communist League of the Soviet Union, a very influential, powerful organization. Went over there and then went to North Vietnam. And so, and so he, and then I lost my job, end up working on the waterfront. <laughs> and um, he sent Jarvis Tyner, matter of fact, they made a mistake, called him John Tyner, it was Jarvis Tyner. And he sent Jarvis, I was working on the waterfront, um, on a steel ship, mm. an oar, oar. And so after the oars taken out with the cranes, uh, we had to go down in the hole of the ship and sweep it up and put it in uh, 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 a container that a crane could come down. You know, of course they wanted every ounce of the oar to be uh, taken out. And so I look up, and this is maybe about four stories, and I see Jarvis. Jarvis said, hey, Tony, <laughs> can I talk to you? Winnie, Winnie told, what we call Winston, Winnie, Winnie told me that uh, he got something that he wanted to see. I said, all right, hold up, man. I got to finish, and then when the lunch break comes, we can meet. Mm. And so Winston is, had told him to come and ask me to head up this new organization, which was formed at his insistence, based upon his vision, called the National Anti-Imperialist Movement in Solidarity with African Liberation. Mm. Too long of a title for the organization. <laughs> Did you know back then you wanted to get every, so it was known who you were, that you weren't a cultural nationalist, that you weren't a, you know, a liberal and so on. So anyway, <laughs> wanted me to head that up. And, you know, I had such respect for him, I said, well, yeah, I'll do it. And uh, that began a different, another trajectory uh, of the ideas of Du Bois, of Pan-Africanism, of international solidarity. But um, that's how I came in contact with him, worked with him very closely. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe one other question, please. Do we have anything from the audience? Yeah, we have some comments. Um, <coughs> um, oh, I don't know. So, um, wait, Doc, your phone. <laughs> um, Richard Giovan Giovannoni says, thank you for keeping the revolutionary legacy of Henry Winston alive in the minds of a new generation of working class youth and students. I was lucky enough to work with Winnie in the last year of his life, 1986. Um, and then Virginia Cott says, good morning. Um, Don DeBar says, the point he just made that our perception of our own work can be obscured by ideological contamination of the enemy took me a long time and some inspiration from talking with him. Amiri Banks says, always focus on the people, always sought to empower the people, mm -hmm. embrace the language, voice, and imagination of those who had been discarded by the intellectualism of so-called radicals. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to say that earlier in the Earlier in the event, we had up to 50 people watching from online. So um, it's really great to have so many people in the room and also online who are remembering Henry Winston like this. Um, and um, we also encourage anyone who joins us for the rest of the day to leave your questions and comments and we'll be reading them out. now breaking for lunch and we'll reconvene at 12.15.
Hello. Well, you have to the. No, but this one also needs to be turned up. Like, yeah, it's in line. In line two. I hear it when it's also like the full sound feedback. Mic two. Mic two sound check. Going to be the afternoon panel. And sound. Okay, great. It sounds okay. Okay. It's skipping. Okay. So, test is my job. now. Is it still skipping? Audio. Okay, what about now? Is it still doing something? Okay, like, do you, it's not this, it's just from here to there. Okay, I'm trying. I don't really know what to talk about, but is it? Okay, it's getting better. Yeah, so um, hope everybody really liked the room. I think it was beautiful. Um, Kevin. Yeah, yeah it's, it's doing better now. Yeah, it's doing better now. I think he's saying that your speech is great. Oh, okay. Oh, all right, yeah, yeah. So after lunch, we're going to have a yeah. roundtable discussion okay. on the science of Henry Preston. Um, after lunch, we're going to have <laughs> the roundtable discussion on the science of Henry Preston. And then we're going to have seven um, roundtable participants. Right? Seven roundtable participants. Oh, but it's okay. Um, and then that'll go on until like 2.30, right? 2.30 or something. And then we're going to have the crisis on the open. And then we're going to have the crisis on the open. And then we're going to yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't even think I think we can um, Yeah, and honestly, I think we did a lot of job. Uh, I think this thing has like a directional, like I guess it's supposed to be omnidirectional, but for some reason. It's only working this way? Yeah. I mean, then that's okay. That means we can just keep it this way, but we might need to be conscious. Right. So, uh, Shambhata.
Neha and Serafina to please come and you know, take your place at the round table. And um, I'll be moderating the discussion. I want to I want to overthrow the establishment and demand a new moderator. <laughs> where, where am I going? Right here. Yeah. Where am I? Good talk. I'm going to even take a picture. Oh, Shantanu, you should say if there are people outside, they should come in. Um, if there are anyone outside um, this room, please come and join us. Oh, you know what? I need. Mean. <laughs> I want to start by saying that uh, you know, we named this panel um, discussion, we named this roundtable as the science of Henry Winston. And that's for a reason. And it's because the life and vision of Henry Winston most vividly brings to life a unique scientific framework of thought. Um, it's a philosophical um, tradition that radically and fundamentally breaks from European thought. Um, and I wanted to say that this framework um, emerges out of the black struggle in America. And it's exemplified with the life work of W.B. Du Bois, James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, Paul Robeson, and Henry Winston, and many others. Um, today, the world is faced with serious existential questions. Are we to follow the logic of war, the only logic behind the thought and actions of an imperialist ruling class? and jump off the cliff headed toward assured destruction? Or are we to think anew and rise to the task of our times and create a new world centered on peace? Do we accept poverty and despair as inevitable problems of the world to seek individual escape from? Or do we dare imagine a future where humanity reaches a new stage? Does science have any role to play in guiding humanity forward or is it to be forever relegated to the playground of experts <laughs> who see the masses of humanity with nothing but um, charity or contempt? These are questions that require a calm reappraisal of the world of thought and action. And I wanted to say it requires a lot, it requires a lot of patience. And I quote um, Du Bois here, um, patience with the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind. <laughs> Patience with the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow. Thankfully, these questions have been studied and have led to the scientific framework that Winston deployed to understand and further the revolutionary process in America. Today, this roundtable will um, explore these questions once more for our times, for there are answers um, that we get from history and which we sorely need. Um, our discussion will be rooted in the recent essay titled Science, the Black Proletariat and Revolution by Dr. Montero. And this essay is going to be, um, is going to be published in the, in the inaugural issue of Avant Garde, a journal of peace, democracy, and science, um, which is going to be launched tomorrow. Um, this essay reminds us that the, um, that the essence of the scientific method is the movement away from dogma and toward truth. Mm -hmm. Quote, in Winston's work, rather than empty theory which predisposes thought to dogmatism, he seeks to know concrete reality and to enrich theory through understanding the concrete and the actual. End quote. This framework allowed Winston to reach the profound conclusion that the class struggle in America can only be furthered by rooting it in the black struggle and especially in the black proletariat created by the interconnected forces of capitalism and a white supremacist social system. Um, in studying the mind that produced strategy, 
the essay formulates three dimensions of science, the rational or empirical, the intuitive, and the revolutionary and moral imperative, which ties science to its revolutionary purpose of changing the world. With Winston, the intuitive dimension is rooted in the life world of the black proletariat, which shaped him, a black proletarian imaginary. Quote, it is the non-rational and the artistic and imaginative dimension of knowing and discovery. It produces leaps in theory, challenging previous theoretic formulations with new, often novel constructions, end quote. The black proletarian imaginary is centered on the human and insists on the infinite capacity of a people whose contributions have led to the only culture, music, art, and democratic striving that America can boast of. Finally, and of profound importance, the essay puts forth the notion of time as a measure of social change, as a crucial category to understand the revolutionary process. Quote, the black proletariat and its consciousness are a major part of determining social time. In essence, measuring movement and its speed. In this respect, it can be viewed as a measure of the maturity of human agency and consciousness. Time is concrete and therefore um, embedded in human social relationships, end quote. Revolutionary ideas and figures are not only produced by time, but also act on time mm -hmm. and can bring about seas of change in no time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, Martin Luther King said, quote, um, human progress never rolls on um, in wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to work, to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always right to do right." End quote. Remember in the history of the last century, we must say the same of Western science. The progress it seems to promise isn't inevitable. It can be, has been, and is every day used in the service of war. It has given us the ability to annihilate ourselves. It has robbed itself of its revolutionary essence and is rightfully looked at with disdain by masses of ordinary people. Right. So I'll stop here and I'll invite the discussions in the round table uh, I mean, to begin the difficult but achievable task of recentering our relationship with and ownership of science. So I'll I'll begin with you, Doctor. Thank you. So, to how much time should each person take? Uh, um, yeah. So each, uh, so like all of you should, you know, uh, like have initial remarks for like five to ten minutes, and then we can start on a discussion. Hopefully I'll be a lot briefer than that. <laughs> so I, I just want to I just want to point out. So like when I when I read the strategy, when I listen to Henry Winston, when I listen to you, Doc, uh, and then we talk about the black proletarian imaginary, the, the the spark in that that I see or the the impetus behind that is not just science, but love. Right? There's a deep love that's happening in the free school in Philadelphia, just walking the streets, where you see the pain, you see the difficulty, the challenges, but you also see the, the love in people's hearts, eyes, their expressions, their body language, even though you see a lot of other stuff too. Mostly the one thing that you get in that bro black proletarian imaginary is that feeling of love. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanted to, oh, I'm Wilmer Leon. Uh, Todd, you should tell him. I'm Todd. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Todd. I grew up in uh, Massachusetts. I went to university in uh, Wisconsin. Now I live in New Mexico in the woods. Uh, and I'm a baker. 
I'm Wilmer Leon, sitting next to Todd, <laughs> and uh, a political scientist uh, and radio talk show host on Radio Sputnik, and uh, still on right now, Sirius XM 126. Um, I wanted to comment on a couple of things that you said. One, you talked about the first thing that got my that, that really got my ear was you mentioned uh, Winston's voice and how it was the voice of a black man. Mm -hmm. And that because of being from Mississippi, I have my, both of my parents are from Louisiana, so I understand that mm -hmm. um, that rhythm and, and, and all of that and, and how one then can be perceived as being less than mm -hmm. just because of the dialect. Yeah, yeah. And that really stood out to me because yesterday or the day before I was watching the news and you know there's this new film out about Bayard Rustin uh -huh. and it's going to be out on Netflix next week I think and the actor who is starring in in the role mentioned that well they mentioned to him that Rustin had a very unique voice and the brother who's playing the lead said that voice was contrived that Rustin created that voice because he wanted to sound like he was more from the Northeast or the Midwest instead of being from the South. And so I, I make this point not to compare or contrast, not to uh, make any judgment, but I, that just got my attention that you made the point about Winston's voice and this film about Rustin, and now we find out that that whole his whole speech pattern he created to present a different perspective, just based on how his voice was perceived. Uh, you made the point that people have to be ideologically remade, yeah. and on my show, a lot of times people will call and say, "Wilmer, what do we do? What do we do? You're, you've got all these people." You got Tony Montero coming on your show and talking all this stuff. You're not telling us what to do. And I said, well, first of all, the answer is in the analysis if you're paying attention to what's being said. But in order for you to understand the analysis, you have to read. And I was at an event in Texas at a UAW, speaking at a UAW event. And the president of the Dallas NAACP stood up and said, you're always telling us to read. You're always telling us to read. I don't want our people to read. I just want them to respond when I call them. And I then can tell them what to do. I said, therein lies your problem. Because you should not be calling them. If they're reading, they'll be calling you, telling you what to do. And then she got up and walked out. Um, so that, to me, is the tie to the scientific. Because one of the things that is, and I'll be done with this, one of the things that is so beautiful about what you all do here is you read. And you may not necessarily read the same things. You may not necessarily have the same perspective or interpretation of what you're reading. But the fact that you are reading is the basis upon which discussion can be grounded and a framework can be formed. Um, I wanted to connect some of the ideas in Doc's essay that Shambhartha also outlined to, the, you know, the what is the dominant view of science and how it's practiced today, and especially in theoretical physics, which is the field that I work in. So this is a question that I have to think about quite a lot. 
um, I think the in Shambhartha's introduction, he was saying, what is the role of science? I think the, the role of science or the scientist in society is something that has remained unresolved. And it has remained unresolved because every serious attempt to answer it or engage with this question has been uh, cut down with the quickness, as Doc would say. Um, the dominant view of science, which is the view of the Western ruling elite, mm -hmm. is that it has to be a neutral, disinterested activity. And because it's neutral, mm -hmm. of course, it can't have anything to do with politics or ideology. Mm -hmm. um, even a question as basic as, what do you study? And to what purpose is something that does not need to be rooted in the concrete living human world, but only in an abstraction of it. So just an abstraction of what the truth is. And the scientist, and this is very from very personal experience, it's just expected to make observations and interpret those observations, but never concern themselves with actually changing the way this world works. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to point out, which I think is sort of central to the philosophy of science that is dominant is the idea of scientific freedom, mm -hmm. which really means you have the freedom to choose what you want to work on and what you want to study, as long as it's compatible with the imperialist state and the war agenda. Now, I think, like, I wanted to talk a little bit about how you can trace this back to the Cold War, mm -hmm. this counter revolution in science, because that was the time that you know, the Soviet Union, the anti-colonial struggles, they were trying to deploy science to solve human problems, to look at, to study the concrete realities of human beings and solve them. And this was also the time that scientists and intellectuals were flocking to the peace movement, having witnessed the devastation of the world wars. Um, of course, this couldn't be allowed to continue if the world had to be enslaved. But particularly in theoretical physics, this was a rich period because there were these big philosophical questions that came to the front with the you know new discoveries in the subatomic realm and this was the time that einstein had these great debates with niels bohr Bonner heisenberg you know others of the positivist school which is portrayed in our times as just about the interpretation of quantum mechanics but it really went to the heart of the question, is there an objective real world mm -hmm. and can we know it? Mm -hmm. And Einstein, like Lenin, and in opposition to the positivists, was very firm on the answer that we, yes, there is an objective real world and we can know it. And science is the way. But after his death, you know, the positivists were just declared winners and these questions were completely discarded even though they had not been resolved. And so is it surprising that that leads to today where the crowning achievement in theoretical physics is string theory, which can only explain our universe in a minimum of 11 dimensions. And it, say, and it says to people that, you know, ours is only one of many million possible universes. So of course you can forget about knowing objective reality, let alone changing it, right? Now, the thing that I think about is what does it say to a young person who is attracted to science because they think it's a way that they can know the world, they can understand something of the universe and can use this understanding to change uh, human condition. What this view of science tells them is basically they have to separate themselves from their moral core. Um, they have to separate themselves from the people and basically forego making any contribution to humanity and continue doing science as you know a thing in itself, which has value just for itself. Mm -hmm. um, so the option that is given to a young person like me is just either become white or you quit science or go crazy. Oh. You can take your pick, right? <laughs> okay. um, so this is why Winston is so important. The philosophy of science and practice that came out of the black struggle challenges this predominant view of science, which has nothing to do with people. Du Bois says, science is a great and worthy mistress, but there is one greater and that is humanity which science serves. One thing there is greater than knowledge, and that is the man who knows. So this view of science centers itself on the human being and sees it as a weapon for social change. This was Winston. And I really find in Doc's essay, the formulation of the three dimensions of Winston's thought very beautiful. And especially the black, black proletarian imaginary <coughs> is a category that's really moving because this imaginary, this 
imaginary emerging out of the life world of a people, oppressed people, poor people, um, deprived of their humanity, but constantly striving for it. And in this struggle, producing, like Shambhata said, some of the most beautiful art, literature, and science, uh, to assert that from this life world can emerge a way to know the world that has answers for the deep philosophical and moral questions we face today. I think this is a very powerful and moving assertion. And this reminds me so much of like King and the civil rights movement, um, and especially the young people who threw themselves into the nonviolence struggle. Uh, they trained in nonviolence and they, they trained to sit there quietly while they were beaten and humiliated and degraded because they believed that love and moral courage had power over brute force and that it could be a trans transformative force in the world. Can you explain this fully with just the scientific rational? I don't think you can. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the possibility, I'm sorry, I just have many, many things that I want to touch upon. Cut me off if I'm going to laugh. Um, the black proletarian imaginary might even be a universal way, way of knowing the world mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. of course, more than Marx and Lenin, I think Du Bois and Winston helps me understand the anti-colonial movement. It helps me understand India better. It helps me understand Gandhi better. For instance, it makes it clear to me why Gandhi's political struggle had to begin in South Africa, yeah. you know, confronted by the color line and how. And it also explains to me why he was able to see that the essence of nonviolence would really reach the world through the black struggle. Um, so the, there's also this point that Doc makes in his essay about a general theory versus a specific theory. Right. And no, and the ascension of the specific to the general. And I think this is very exciting. The deep connection of the black struggle with the world anti-colonial movements and these movements actually helps me understand Du Bois's category, uh, Du Bois's assertion that the black worker is a central uh, category to understand the world and to understand where the possibilities for mounting a mass struggle for peace and democracy lies. Um, this is the concrete universal, which Lenin explained as, quote, not merely an abstract universal, but a universal which comprises in itself the wealth of the particular, the individual, mm -hmm. the single, mm -hmm. end quote. So starting from the general theory of Marxism-Leninism, when Winston deploys the Boisian logic to elevate it to the concrete, he, he's elevating it to the uni concrete universal, mm -hmm. which opens up the possibility of a new general theory that better answers the moral and philosophical questions of this time. Now, this is extremely important today because of the rise of the Afro-Asiatic world, which is striving to make not just economic, political breaks from the West, but also an epistemic break from the West, a new way to understand the world, new way to explain what's going on around the world. This also explains why the Black Freedom Movement and its scientific and philosophical achievements have been so viciously attacked and trivialized by the Western establishment. It, because its existence depends on thwarting every attempt uh, at upholding an sorry right. <laughs> its existence depends on thwarting every attempt to topple an epistemology that supports imperialism and war. And if the only way you, to know the world is the white way, well then that's the only world you know. And you cannot, you cannot accept the West on your own terms. You must comply. And this is what a young person like me finds in American universities in the name of science. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm going to stop here because I feel like I've been talking for too long. <laughs> but I will end by saying that I'm truly grateful that I found somebody like Winston through talk and through the preschool. Because learning about him, learning how he thought of science, it really gives me hope and courage because it's an assertion that human beings can struggle and get to know the world mm -hmm. and can wield science as a weapon in the ideological struggle. And this is really the education that I should have gotten, but Very I'm good. glad I'm getting it <laughs> from, you know, from preschool. Sarah Dana, also a member of the preschool. Um, history is the ongoing actions of men and women. Science is not a question of arithmetic alone, 
but a concrete method for each and every human being. It is the way of knowing the world, ourselves in the world, and our said purpose, and the means to which we seek our ends. The building of civilization and peace depends upon a scientific approach of analysis and what would make of the human being. What do we know as truth? I believe we decide that today. I'm speaking from the generation of, this, of the turn of the century, the generation that was born at the end of the first thousand years and the turn of another thousand years. Our generation has a choice to fight either in building a century or destroying civilization. Every child and baby born from us for will carry what world we left for them. So I think that every life is really on the line. Yeah. Those who have been martyred on the streets of what have, we have been calling holy because of Jesus, Muhammad, and Moses, Palestine, to the streets of North Philly with brothers taking each other's lives, to the homes of the deindustrialized cities and suburbs, of their own sons taking their own lives through fentanyl, all men and women and children have the nature of the living God embedded in our souls. It has been this nature because we, and speaking for Americans, wish of our nation to make democracy real. And it has called upon us the responsibility to, quote, do unto you as you would have them do to you. And I think Baldwin also knows this crisis of neocolonialism and imperialism would happen. Um, the black proletariat imaginary emerges because it is through great will and courage to earn one's own dignity without cutting corners and begin to carry it and make dignity of, of value above all the crux of oneself. And what Baldwin also sees is the potential if we, speaking as Americans, don't or if we lose, in a way, a certain viewpoint of God, or the light, or our sense of aliveness, if this previously mentioned law completely actualizes itself and becomes true. For, in the case of war, which is both a maiming of the internal and external, quote, what will happen to all this beauty? And this is found in uh, the fire next time. Um, I could also see that the intransigence and ignorance of the white world might make that vengeance inevitable. A vengeance that does not really depend on and cannot be executed by or prevented by any person or organization and that cannot be prevented by any police force or army. A historical vengeance, a cosmic vengeance mm. based on the law that we recognize when we say whatever goes up must come down. Yes. And here we are at the center of the arc, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable and most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of others, do not falter in our duty now we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible and the song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. So Baldwin is saying it is the time to create consciousness, wake up the living dead, make the impossible possible. It is a time to decide how to use the inevitable motion of history up until this point, meaning what does Martin Luther King's death really mean to us? What does anything mean at all, and for what end? This means that history is defined by the values of the people, that know that war is murder and the degradation of the poor, that know that the moral arc of history bends towards justice, justice, and ultimately is understood through a Lenin Du Bois synthesis, not a history of the elite or those interested of sidelining the natural process of revolution and thus sidelining world peace and the achievement of coexistence. I personally, Serafina, am interested in the truth and what we must learn to build civilization. It is time to make love and peace real, make love and peace concrete in our internal and external clocks. Time is a weapon of mass creative force 
and its only holster is truth. We have the floor of the room, and the world is watching what will become of every one of us. And so every life has an absolute potential in making of civilization in our country, from the moment of birth until death. The essence, the root foundation of our America is through the history and great struggle against slavery and our white supremacist social system. And all art, music, and science stem from this nature, or dialectical force that struggle inspires. This dialectical force is the moral choice, and we live with this every day. It is always time to do right. And so specifically, what I was focused on in response to the um, essay that Doc had written was the black proletarian imaginary, which is essence of our notion of what is called American, was identified through the life and experience of Martin Luther King, of the Martin Luther King led move, civil rights movement. Civil is a distinct category because it means ordinary person, distinct from the military. Who better to take advantage of this effect upon history or Martin Luther King Jr.'s effect upon history than ordinary people? The ruling elite have asserted itself in place of the everyday people, making people think of themselves in ways that they are not. You believe you carry the world with you? You believe in truth and peace? You want to struggle against racism? It can be instead commodified because the struggle for freedom didn't work out for Martin Luther King. Because in a time of a, people, of a people's weakness, after war and murder of a movement, they gave us a quick war on oil and civilization for money, a war for, on the soul through drugs and jobs, the tactic of the elite to drain the people of the will to struggle for peace and democracy, and buy time for the building of a warmongering state, a foreign entity amongst the people because it is not of the people, but an entity that contradicts the people in moral consciousness and concretely impoverishes us all. Its ultimate goal is to turn against the people, each of us, and end time itself. Hmm. Their goal was to make us all forget about who we have become and unable to see the world we are a part of. So the two essential qualities of the black proletariat imaginary illustrated is the nature of the world house that is embedded in the consciousness of the black proletariat. What else made John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Sun Ra, or Cecil Taylor, um, and the essential quality of dignity, dignity, being the root of any human being who is an American. Um, these two values occurred because of the struggle for freedom and how we see ourselves capable of loving ourselves or living at all. What we do know of love now is our responsibility to the future. And it means we have peace and the struggle for freedom as a first priority um, to the world's peoples. And that's what Todd had mentioned earlier about love, but King also illustrates a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about the ultimate. Ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle, St. John. Let us love one another for love is God. <laughs> what this complex of billionaires, financial interests, and elites didn't understand about didn't understand about this moment in history is that God stands on the side of peace. God stands for right. What they don't understand, what they didn't understand uh, was the fundamental principle to truth. Is that though, is that truth reconciled is reconciled ongoingly. And concrete jungles are created because though there is concrete a, or a pressure or material that imposes and does not mix with soil. Soil is a natural consistency of the planet and has a way of getting what it needs because it needs it. Light, a word that is used as a noun, verb, or adjective, light is the source of illumination, and it can also mean not heavy. The arc that Baldwin spoke of earlier, would vengeance be inevitable? Or as he had also said, would it be possible that our consciousness could be created in a new way that sees a way out? And before doing what is done to you, first, or before doing what is done to you, doing the best first and saving the worst judgment and action for last, using the most creative potential of love and its spirit to create new levels of science, philosophy, and art. The nature of art is concrete, for isn't it true that the William Cullen poem that Martin Luther King Jr. understood and used, that truth crushed to the earth will rise again? Have we not seen this occur? I think that we have. 
And as James Baldwin said to his nephew, this meaning to be better against all odds, for there are many, many women and men who before us showed us to lead, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step is enough for me. So I say that we make Martin Luther King Shaheed mean something. Baldwin says that it will be hard, but he says to his nephew that we all come from a sturdy peasant stock, men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds achieved an assailable and a monumental dignity. We all come from a long line of great poets, some of them the greatest poets since Homer. Yes. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. Martin Luther King Jr. also said that we shall overcome because we must. It is a necessity for the ever-present future and the immoral child, the children's children that live forever and grow and develop toward perfection as they are trained. We must for the world that we haven't yet seen, but have to make real. The world we can imagine that is better than what we have been given now. The future that will ultimately come with the cost of our commitment to peace. And this is so because truth forever is on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. I'm Neha. I'm also a member of the Sunday Creek School. And I'm going to say a lot of things that Uba has already said, but I would still say it because I'm also uh, a scientist. And I got into science as a young person, very curious about the world. She, I was the curious person, she was different to me. <laughs> uh, but soon I found the space very stifling because uh, as a young person, when you join, like I'm from biology, so you join and you were presented with e either like certain esoteric, very specific questions that you could study, or you could go, if you're really interested in doing something from society, you could do something at the intersection of medicine and biology. But soon you realize that these are extremely superficial choices. They both serve a certain class, and that's the ruling class, because everything is related to funding. And <coughs> at the end of the day, this is funded through war. And this sort of like puts you in a place where you start questioning what your purpose is. And you feel very disillusioned by the whole thing. And uh, I think like through free school and through Doc's essay and like through interaction with people in the free school, like I've been trying to understand what my role is as a person in science, but also to understand what science, what does science really mean? <laughs> like, because science, the way we are taught, had been, it has been narrowed so much that I can't, even though I've been in science for like 10 years or so, I don't think I can still understand the philosophy. I didn't know, I didn't think of it in the broadest sense of as a, as a uh, pursuit that progresses that helps in the progress of human society as uh, not not in the narrow sense of finding the next cure to certain disease but in the terms of ideas and how they move forward and how they help society transition mm -hmm. uh, but i i wonder why that that is how it is today and looking back uh, the voice helps us understand this and understand this because he says that that on the way uh, of progress, like science has been the vanguard of human pro progress, but on its way it faltered, it made a huge blunder because it became complicit in modern science became complicit in the subjugation of a majority, of a vast majority of humanity. It chose to maintain this lie of white supremacy uh, by constructing reasons and, law and theories to say that it was okay for a certain people to subjugate the rest of humanity. And that 
eroded the moral base for uh, science. And science today as a space, I feel like it's a very homogeneous space. Uh, it demands conformity of thought. It says that you must hate your civilization or your people and the people you see around you. Only then you can have a place at the table. And, uh, and I, I think only through the science reading book and through uh, discussions that I've realized that science can actually serve in this thing of the democratic struggle. And uh, yeah, and, and, and then looking back, like I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. Uh, yeah, so Du Bois says that the real argument from the democracy is that in the people we have the source of that endless life and unbounded wisdom which the rulers of men have. Science and democracy must utilize this vast mine of human experience to know the truth and further mankind. And that is what the black proletariat imaginary I understand as, as, as the universal method of knowing, but it is tethered in something civilizational. The values that, that the black civilization upholds, I think they speak to more than just, just a part of humanity. They speak to a large, that all of darker humanity. And that is why a king and a Gandhi could see each other and, and even a Romesh could see the, the importance of the black worker in this struggle for peace and democracy. And now I understand why Robeson <laughs> talks about, uh, in primitives he says that Western science has become more and more abstract. It looks down upon people yeah. and it, it has reached a point where it has exhausted itself because it has moved away from the very people that are the source of ideas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is because of this that today science stagnates. It cannot renew itself and it, uh, it, it pretends that there are experts who know. It has this over-reliance on evidence and claims that people who can generate such evidence are the experts and they know and the rest of the people are ignorant. But, But yeah, democracy is more than like listening to, uh, actually there are two things, like listening to the documentary today morning, I think one thing I appreciated was like Winston saying this thing about, about uh, uh, the, the debates that unemployed youth would have. He said he called it, there were the most democratic spaces because people could debate out ideas. And you wonder like, that was a, a time when people could do that. And today we see a Kensington where people are provided safe needles and asked to just like live a life of, they're forced into a life of passivity by providing mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But what they need is knowledge. What they need is a knowledge of self, a knowledge of, of what their role is in shaping the world. And equipped with that, I think like anybody can actually be a part of this revolutionary process. We need that kind of an education, that kind of a knowledge that enables people to become revolutionaries. And yeah, I don't want to go on for Yeah, I, I also wanted to say that Du Bois, the way he thought, think, says that democracy is is the movement towards the ultimate goal of realization of the fullest potential of individuals for the benefit of the collective. And he saw democracy itself as an experiment that must be tried and tested and again and again the knowledge that people get from it to be applied. And, and it, it cannot exist without the broadest measure of justice to everybody. And, and he said that science must be in this process favored in in or biased in the favor of the oppressed and stand against the empire. He asserted that the study of man cannot be done with just a scientific method of that's rooted in rationality. It must also account for uh, the, the intuitive. And, and for all of this, like human action is central for understanding man and his social relationships. Another figure that also came up in the documentary, but also again and again is Didi Kosami. He did the same for, he was an Indian scientist who was Marxist, 
but he also studied the Indian people and he he used multiple methods, he combined multiple methods and multiple disciplines to study the Indian people. And he had this formulation of science as the cognition of necessity, placing science in the larger purview of human, humanity mm. and human liberation. He said individual freedom must be concretely rooted in the material yeah. world and is thus limited, to the need, thus limited by the needs of the masses. And he's, he, I'm quoting him here, he says, the scientist needs this freedom most of all, namely the freedom from servitude to a particular class. Only in the science plan for the benefit of all mankind, not the bacteriological, atomic or psychological or other mass warfare, can the scientist be really free. And it is very pertinent today, because today science continues to serve the war agenda of the American ruling elite. Most of the questions of active research are funded by this war budget. And they decide what is of importance and or not. And as Puva mentioned, it is also the time when certain theories are created to say that there is no way of knowing the truth, or like human beings have done it all, and machines must take over now. So today, when we are at the brink of a world war, and the war crazy ruling elite are being challenged at home by their own people, we must ask ourselves, is it really a democracy? when a large number of people are living in abject poverty, hunger, and are denied the dignity of jobs. And is it really a democracy when, in the name of defending it, thousands of children are killed? And this current system of Western democracy is crumbling because of the lies it built, or on which it was built. And we see, on the other hand, the rise of a united Asia and Africa. And the old system of knowledge must and cannot cannot function in this system because the old ways of knowing are no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. So the new the new way of knowing must be rooted in certain civilizational values that keeps people at the center of it and is in the vanguard of peace and justice. And the sign it is the, at this moment in history that we must reclaim science and and build a science for the people. It must be renewed and rejuvenated as we transition to the age of humanity, as was said in the introduction. And science must be transformed by the love that Baldwin and King talk about. It must also undergo a revolution of values to serve the people that it was supposed to serve. I wanted to ask Doc if he if you want to respond to some of the initial remarks. Yeah, um, just a few things. So I thank everybody for reading the essay and commenting upon it. Uh, and I, I I'm happy that uh, everybody was drawn to this idea of the black proletariat imaginary. Um, and um, let me just say, you know, what I was uh, trying to get at in saying that uh, Winston's uh, method was a trialectic, that there were three dimensions, uh, the rational scientific, which is more readily associated with Marx and Lenin and Marxism-Leninism. He saw that as a framework, a kind of general science. Uh, but then, and you could see it in the uh, documentary, that his mind was not trapped in a set of theories of concepts, that he transcended them in order to understand what they, that is Marx and Lenin and Marxism and so on, did not see. Uh, and this created a tension, which I tried to address, of people that said, well, why is your book, Henry Winston, chairman of the Communist Party, entitled Strategy for a Black Agenda? Is not the Communist Party a working class party? And should you have not 
should you not have, I'm sorry, titled the book Strategy for a Class Agenda. Uh, frankly, there are many people, several people who were invited here today who probably didn't show up because the book is entitled Strategy for Black Agenda. Had it been strategy for a class agenda, there are many people who are not here now who were invited who would come, and I know a couple of them. Uh, and, um, but what he saw is what they're incapable of seeing because of this special uh, feature that goes beyond the quote, rational scientific, and I put quotes around that, to the intuitive imaginary dimension, but not only intuitive, but an intuition and imagination linked to the black proletariat. And that is why his life is so important to understanding how he did science. But then that, that in itself, those two are not enough in the black proletarian imaginary, as significant as it is, I think it helps understand almost everything in black music, black art, black thinking, black religion, uh, which is obscured in normal social science. And you, you, you get, let me just say this, you get um, thinkers and cultural um, theorists, like chasing their tails. They don't understand jazz. They don't understand the blues. They don't understand the black church. They don't understand rhythm and blues. Uh, uh, and that's why there is such a strict color line within art, uh, because of a failure to understand this unique thing that we're calling the black proletariat imaginary. And I agree with Purva that it is something universal in it, that there is that imaginary, especially in all people fighting for freedom, for whom the imaginary, the imagination, the intuitiveness has been made into a joke. Perhaps that's not the right word, but trivialize the trivialization and the marginalization of the product of this imaginary and of the imaginary itself. But then there is that third dimension, and I called it the moral and revolutionary. And for me, the moral cannot be separated from the revolutionary. Um, I always, I always find myself, or often find myself, in not just debates, but arguments with people. Why can't you understand that morality is not just about you being a do-gooder, or you uh, virtue signaling, I don't know to whom, maybe to yourself, what is so difficult to understand that the moral is connected to the revolutionary? Right. And you cannot be moral without being revolutionary, or you can't be moral and be counter-revolutionary. Or to put it another way, you want to know why everybody's leaving the churches? Mm -hmm. Because of the fake morality <laughs> that is contextualized in a counter-revolutionary framework. Um, Politics as well. Well, of course, the political realm. So I think that as we look at Winston, a book written 50 years ago, not understood when it was written, certainly not understood today by many, that to grasp what is its meaning now 
Its meaning, I think, as it said in the essay, Henry Winston for a new epoch. How does Henry Winston live in this epoch? How do we give him life? Is it just to acknowledge his name and to say in an empty way he was the chairman of the Communist Party and we're going to name an auditorium after him? Or is it to take the essence of a scientific method and see its usefulness in the political, moral, and spiritual education of children and youth today. That his way of thinking, his way of analyzing, not only becomes a way of doing revolutionary science, but a way of constructing pedagogies, especially for children and youth. My last point. If there was ever any question about the function of elite universities in American society, it is being clarified and exposed at this moment. Where young people, many in their late teens and early 20s, barely out of childhood themselves, are searching for a moral foundation, a moral imperative linked to the struggle to make the world better. And what do they get from the donors and administrators and professors, many professors, ruthless, unprincipled attacks upon them, arresting them, uh, doxing them, saying that if you stand up for the children of Palestine, we will make sure you never get a job. We will ruin you. As though the student debt hadn't pretty much done that anyway. This is what the universities existed, exist for. You know, I, and I, I didn't know much about elite universities. I went to a historically black college. I only really learned about them when so many young people came into the free school who themselves had graduated from elite Ivy League universities. And I listened to their stories. I listened to the ways that they were treated. And it was unimaginable to me that either you, as Purba and, and, and Neha, who were scientists, and, and Shambarta, who was a scientist, highly trained, very disciplined people, were told, and they're from India, by the way, abandon your civilization, become white, and every day that you're here, Make sure that you praise and thank your white masters for allowing you to come into this country. This is horrible. But this is the function of the university, not to promote science, as they have said, but to promote imperialism. And uh, so that's what I would say. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, we can open up the discussion. Uh, like, you know, I think a rich discussion will follow given like what all of you have said. Um, I'm going to open the discussion up for the audience, but I also wanted to start us off. Oh, is it not loud enough? No, no just hold it. It's not me. Okay, okay. You hold it to your mouth. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like, you know, I think like there are a lot of things that all of you talked about, but I was trying to like, you know, I'm trying to connect some of the things that you were saying. And I think this, like this question kept coming up, you know, starting from uh, like, you know, Todd, what you said. Um, 
I think all of you touched on this, the question of love. And like, you know, I realized that all of you are talking about love in the sense that, you know, King talks about love, that we're talking about love, um, you know, love with power to change the world. Mm. And, you know, I was thinking of how, like this question of, of epistemology that you're talking about in, you know, in, in, in your article, but also in what all of you are saying, that how do we know how do we know the world we live in? And this thing right. that Purva was saying that, you know, the way we know the world is related to the world we know. Like, you know, the, like the world we actually know is related to how we know the world. And, you know, if we, like, if our epistemology is based in um, white supremacy, mm -hmm. that is going to be the world. I think I'm sort of paraphrasing what you were saying. But, uh, like, this question of love and and the role that love plays in knowing the world. This is something this is I found very, this is it's fundamentally different from how we are taught to, you know, like how, um, from like how we are taught science, but also in general, I think how we are taught to think in uh, like in the Western universities. And I think it's, it goes beyond the Western university. It's, it's something to do with, you know, the thought of the thought that comes from the enlightenment, like you know, the European enlightenment. Uh -huh. And I wanted to see if you know, like any of you had, uh, like you wanted to say anything more about that. The other thing I wanted to mention, which is related to this, is you know this role of like the role of the American university as like as the vanguard of imperialism, like you were saying, mm -hmm. dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you know this, like it's very clear to like you know all of us that this is the new project of imperialism, where you train, I mean, westernized elites throughout the world. Who are to serve the purpose of imperialism, and this is very much like you know when Winston is talking about like when Winston is writing strategy, and he says that uh, that oppressors are not divided by color. It seems <laughs> that this continues that project that you know it's it comes from the university, and and like you know what do you see as the like you know the way forward for students of science and of education. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, you can um, pass the mic whoever wants to start. I can make a short comment about the first part of what you were saying about this thing of love and how love is not considered to be a natural part of a scientific way to know the world. And I think this is related to what both Todd and Wilmer you were saying and Doc touching upon this in his remarks after the documentary, uh, commenting on the poetics of you know yes. black speech mm -hmm. and especially the way Winston spoke. Um, I do think, I mean, it is a unique way. I mean, for love to know the world through a lens of love sort of roots you in human beings mm -hmm. as opposed to some abstract idea of what you're searching for as the truth. Um, I think the relegation of science to the latter category where truth is abstract, it has nothing to do with human beings, mm -hmm. sort of precludes love and emotion or the intuitive to be a part of the scientific process. But I don't think it was always like that because in the science reading group that we do in free school, we have read about how Einstein actually really relied on the intuitive method as being equally important to yes. observations. And the, so there's a pre-experimental, a basis to your thought that sort of guides not only the questions you try to answer, but also the way you go about answering it. And this thing about love, this is my last point, I promise. <laughs> the, the, the thing about love and the intuitive, it also reminded me, and I was say, saying this to Doc when you were speaking, of how Noam Chomsky says that he finds it intolerable to listen to King's speeches because it's too emotional. What he's really saying is, Oh, we should not really feel what we are saying. As scientists, our our purpose is to be rational and objective. Mm -hmm. But then it leads to a science which is complicit in war, uh -huh. it, which can look the other way. Uh -huh. When you know, basically, all these elite universities they become, you know, they they basically complicit in 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 you know the in the military industrial complex. So. So that's that's sort of what I was thinking of when when you were asking this question, and I mean also Gandhi, you know, Gandhi was 
is sort of looked upon as an eccentric who mm -hmm. always operated from the extra rational. And so it's easy to just put him on a pedestal as a spiritual person, as a spiritual leader who has nothing to do with the scientific method towards social change or mm -hmm. evolution. Mm -hmm. But I think these are just constructs to keep science away from the purpose of human progress. Uh, this whole idea of, of love made me think, reflect on uh, Dr. King saying that uh, power without love is reckless and sentimental mm -hmm. and love without power is uh, sentimental and abusive. And listening to you talking about science and the aspect of love in the context of science, and then uh, you mentioned Einstein, mm -hmm. then I started thinking about, well, how does it get co-opted? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it seems to one of the, or two of the elements that seem to co-opt it, the elements of imperialism mm -hmm. and the elements of capitalism, mm -hmm. when you uh, when you and and hopefully this isn't incredibly disjointed. Um, you talking about the elite institution? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not only the elite institution; mm -hmm. it's the historically black institution uh, that, I, as a Hamptonian. And a Howardite. But tell them what a Hamptonian is. Oh, someone to graduate. Not the Hamptons. No, someone who graduated from I graduated from Hampton Institute, <laughs> what is what is now Hampton University. Uh, the HBCU in Hampton, Virginia. Yeah, right. Uh, there's a there I, I bring that up because there is a there is a construct or a mode of thinking that even the H we, ha we tend to have a stereotype or a misconception of the HBCU. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that they are progressive, incredibly progressive institutions because they are black institutions. Right. But what you, when you start to understand why they were created in the first place, mm -hmm. they were primarily created to teach us how to assimilate yes. into mainstream society not to promote, to uh, create a science around our liberation and our freedom. That, that's not why those institutions were created. Uh, so I, I make that side point just to say that, that uh, Howard and Hampton are just as guilty as Harvard and Yale. Of, of, <laughs> you think just as? Okay. If not more, okay. okay. <laughs> you know. uh, but, but, but anyway, uh, so I just want, to make the point that when, when we, you talk about the, the connection or the connectivity be, between love and science, there, the deviation seems to come into play when imperialism and capitalism are injected uh, into, hence the, the uh, uh, Bolt, the, the, the Berkeley law professor mm -hmm. who wrote the letter to the law firm saying that my students that are protesting in favor of Palestine do not consider them for employment. Well, that's, a, that's now imperialism and capitalism being, being injected uh, in, into, in, into the argument. Um, so, and then the, uh, the other point I wanted to, to get, just to hit on your uh, part of your piece, you talked about time history and, and black proletarian agency. And you wrote, it cannot be said enough, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction is a great and transgressive historical work designed as a study of socio-historical time. Time is a measurement of movement. Historical time is a measure of the velocity of social and historical change rooted in the struggles of human beings. And that made me think about the most recent discussions of what's happening in Palestine and how when you listen to mainstream or dominant Western so-called analysis of this, the time is as though everything here started on October 7th. They ignore an entire 75 year history of oppression. And it's, the, it's as though Hamas just woke up on the 6th of October and said, hey, tomorrow morning, I know, I know what we're gonna do. 
we're going to shoot some missiles and we're going to storm into the West Bank and drive everybody crazy. Um, so being able to control that historic analysis uh, plays a very, very, very key role in being able to control one's assessment of that analysis. Uh, and when you talk about the relevance of Henry Winston and the strategy for a black agenda, as, as I reread this in preparation for today, all I could think about was what's going on in Palestine right. and how so many of the ideas and concepts and constructs that he was creating are incredibly, incredibly applicable to that ongoing struggle today. Can I just say one? Oh, I'm sorry, Todd. You go I just want to add one, one quick thing, and not, not only October 7th, but we have to bring up Ukraine because the exact same thing. Oh, absolutely. Where they just eliminated yeah. the history, they just made it go away. Mm -hmm. It all. Putin woke up one morning, oh, yeah. hair across his ass, and invaded Ukraine. Well, because you know that he's crazy. Right. He's insane. He's an authoritarian. Yes. And that's all yeah. I wanted and to then, add. Right. And, oh, and he also wants to take over the world. I forgot right. that yeah, one, yeah, too. Yeah. Europe. Yeah. No, no, the world. Well, you're first. You know, this question of time is a very difficult one for social science and for natural science, for physics, theoretical physics. Uh, what I wanted to say just on this, using the Palestine example, uh, the oppressor classes wish to control time, social time, by controlling the understanding of social historical time, by controlling the socio-historical understanding or narrative, or the narrative of socio-historical time, they have made an ideological move that says to the oppressed that you cannot do anything, you must wait on time. Right. It is a way of forcing passivity upon the oppressed and exploited. When the oppressed takes history in their hands, they ideologically recapture time from the oppressor. Time is not a static uh, phenomenon. You'll get yours by and by. Yeah, we do not exist in this static time, space, framework. Mm -hmm. We make it. And that's why I connected time to the black, black proletarian agency. I just, it's a very difficult thing to understand. First of all, the time is not just a chronology, mm -hmm. a saying what came after this and what came then, you know, and so on. Time is shaped, especially by the revolutionary action of people struggling to be free. When the unfree recognize that they can capture time from their oppressors and in so doing, speed it up. So it's not just what the clock on the wall says. It is not a matter of the, um, the Earth going around the sun or gravitating on its axis. That is static time. But human time has every potential in the world to be reordered and to be sped up. That's and if I could make one more, yes. one more point to that. A little self-promotion here. Uh, I, I just uh, published an op-ed called The Dangers of Menstrual Diplomacy. Oh yeah. And what what you what you talking about how these concepts of patience are being impressed upon the black I, no I said passivity. Okay. Okay. 
uh, passivity uh, is being impressed upon the black proletariat, in many instances, it's the black bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. or as Glenn Ford would say, the black misleadership class mm -hmm. that is being used to send that message. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and that is the basis of my piece. That's what I'm in, that's what I am labeling minstrel diplomacy. It's black faces mm -hmm. such as uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield at the UN and Lloyd Austin as a Secretary of Defense and uh, Obama. Barack Obama with his, with his so-called analysis yeah. Yeah. of what happened in Gaza. Yeah. That analysis was really, what was being passed off as analysis was really just ahistoric gibberish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or Gregory Meeks trying to convince us that it's a good idea to, to reinvade Haiti. All of those kinds of things, that's, those are black faces on white folks' foolishness, which is nothing but a minstrel show. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that not only do we understand that the message of passivity is being sent, but we also have to understand who is being employed to send that message. Can I right. just say right. this? Right. Uh, uh, this is a very important point because uh, time is an ideological weapon against the oppressed. Um, first of all, the view of time that we normally have, the normal view of time, ideologically, is, a, is part and parcel of a liberal worldview. By a liberal worldview, I'm not, not talking about a worldview of greater freedom. I'm talking about a worldview of, of democracy of human beings that says that it is the white West and the white Western man as an individual uh, whose freedom is more important than anybody else's. I don't know whether I made that clear or not. But this worldview has been infused into many uh, forms of uh, protest and narrative that now go under the guise of socialism, social democracy. And you know, the prime example, you, you talk about the black misleadership class, but what about the Bernie, Bernie Sanders, Sanders of the world? Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, uh, a complete betrayer of a whole generation of young people who look to him as an alternative to the politics, the capitalist politics, and then just sold them out with the quickness and is now a, a running doll for Joe Biden and the war makers as well as Netanyahu and that group of genocidists in Israel. So I think, I think it, is, it behooves us to have a scientific understanding of time, that time is embedded in the material relationships of society. It is not transcendent. It is embedded. It is a material force. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about social relations, we're talking about the totality of the relationships between human beings. I would just, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, just, I was just thinking about um, the question about love, and because I was going back to it, not in a sense that it has nothing related to what you guys are saying actually at all, but because um, what the question of science to me, or in the, I guess, broader point, is the making of human beings. Like you're saying, the relation of societies, the relation of human beings, mm -hmm. and the science, or the question of science, is what I was, you know, trying to say is that um, the mind, as a tool mm -hmm. of operation for science, um, the human being as a tool, and um, yeah, I just wanted to add that because love is, like we're saying, also a tool, a weapon for struggle. Love is base, is the basic really, like, uh, it's a moral, it's a question of the morale, the emotional, the question of the soul. Um, and so 
both have you know place within the development of the human being or any person I guess in this case a democracy of America and so the, the, the framing of the mind or what would make of the mind if based upon scientific processes um, that that becomes a question in my head because say a, a, like whatever would be a individual in China or an individual in North Korea um, when we have studied these places people move with a certain sense not only of their own civilization which is specific but the what makes the society move and engage and develop and the question of science and the question of love in this case has to deal with the development of the human being in a, yes. in a democracy specifically in America. Yes. Yes. Sure. I hope you don't mind if I just disagree with you slightly, Serafina. Um, this idea of time or love or any of this as instruments. Um, indeed, from the standpoint of the ruling elites, all of these categories can be, quote, instrumentalized to serve their class interests, to serve their political purposes. For us, love is not instrumentalized, or for the ruling class, as they say, weaponized, uh, for us, love is a human relationship. Um, the key to our existence. Not to be transactionalized or weaponized or uh, commodified. You know, and I, the reason I raise this, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you were saying any of this, but in our conceptualization of these things, I think we have to be careful not to let the language of the oppressor class, the ruling elite, become a part of our forming of these things. I would just, I, I think I know what you were saying, but I disagree with the use of um, an instrument of, a, it functions as, a, it is, um, its role is, you see what I'm saying? Um, that separates these very um, necessary human relationships from the human. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Wow. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let, let, uh, let, yeah. let Michelle go first. No, I'm just saying people who oh, want to okay. talk to I think Nihal had a lot was going to go. I wanted to ask one more question on the idea of time, actually, because I think what yeah, I think raising it as this category has been really clarifying for me. And especially, well, what I wanted to ask is about the relationship between this category you mentioned in your essay of socio-historical time and then the category of social time. Because from my understanding also of this discussion, socio-historical time, it's connected to the scientific rational dimension and also to the discovery of truth. For example, the line that you had read out um, about Black Reconstruction in America, designed as a study of socio-historical time. So what does it mean that this truth has been discovered, that that knowledge now exists, that it has changed history? And then we have social time, which I think we might have read this as well, but Dr. Monteri wrote, the actions of human beings and of classes determine social time. Humans can both make time through their actions, and we can know time through scientific observation. Human social relationships have time embedded in them, yet human agency determines time, especially its velocity. And I bring that up because I agree with what people were saying, that this is a time when the ruling elite, especially on the youth, tries to peddle 
a great sense of cynicism, which then breeds decadence and also breeds stasis and passivity. And so people have a very deadened relationship to both social time and socio-historical time. But what I'm trying to understand is if social time is in some ways an expression of the moral imperative, you realize you can make history, you realize that your sense of morality has no option but to be developed into revolutionary action, then how is that first nurtured by our understanding of time, but then also nurtured by our relationship to socio-historical time right. as an expression of the truth as well? I, I have to. I have to apologize. I may have been confused. Oh. I, I see all social time as socio-historical oh, time. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, uh, and I'd have to say, I hope I got it right. This is a very difficult question. Time, it's a difficult question for sociology, for philosophy, and for natural science, for theoretical physics as Purva points out. In science, normal science, time is, now this is, a, and I have to uh, defer to the physicists here. I think that time is treated in its rationalist way, that is a condition rather than a a part of. In other words, I think even if you take Einstein's famous uh, equation E equals mc squared, uh, c, m, m, c squared is time, motion. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> but to me, as I understand that equation, time is neither part of mass or of energy if I have it right, or at least it is interpreted that way. Uh, I think that social time, socio-historical time, is so embedded in the relationships of people, production relationships, uh, other social relationships. Uh, and I'll end on this. This was a conundrum for Karl Marx and Das Kapital, where he tried to understand the word day, you know? And, uh, and I, I still think it is a problem uh, because time is not connected to the human being and human agency. But I, I think that's what I would say. And I, I still don't think I have it right, by the way. Wait, I just I just wanted to add a small thing that what Doc was saying made me think about, which is also that the way I understand the conception of social time yes. in Doc's essay, I feel like what you're saying is also that time, as according to the natural sciences definition yes. of theoretical phys physics definition, is a quantitative measure of something uh -huh. moving forward. Uh -huh. But what you're saying really is that it's it can be and it should be thought of as a qualitative measure <laughs> of something where what it's qualifying and this is why you know not all moments in history are the same there are revolutionary moments which make new epistemologies possible mm -hmm. like for instance and i say this to doc a lot like when somebody like a king comes into the world the world yes. has to change that's right to accommodate mm -hmm. accommodate this human being mm -hmm. th these new ideas and you can never go back. Like you can never mm -hmm. jump over that and go back to a time where mm -hmm. these ideas did not exist. So I think the way that I could make most sense of this conception of time being embedded in human relationships is the idea that time is not just a quantitative measure, but it's a qualifying, a qu yeah. qualitative I, measure. It's what you do. It's yeah. Al <laughs> along with how you do it and when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I just had a question for oh, this is because uh, I would, this is sort of related to the part of Michelle's question about truth because because even Einstein talks about truth as being there is an objective truth that 
is not it, it is ever changing because of the world changing due to human action but it is also objective in a way that it must be it can be known only through human action but uh, but it's not it's not something it's not relative it, it is an it's absolute not what? it's not relative so so yeah I, I, I find this a little confusing because yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I <laughs> <laughs> we leave it at confusion no, <laughs> I have my little window right here for a minute. So I'm going to use the word syntax, but I'm thinking about Henry Winston in this regard with Seraphine, who was it's like an announcement. But I'm I'm speaking about how how a certain word sometimes in the syntax, you know, I'm coloring the word right now for love, but in the way the dimensions that she's like, I'm assuming she's speaking from because I'm feel that's just what I'm feeling is that it's hard to color the beloved. If I say, this is my beloved land, mm -hmm. and then I'm speaking to a woman that I, that I love, right? And I said, she is my beloved. Mm -hmm. but, this, but the coloration that I'm putting on to love is something that's equal to the land of how you love the land you was born in. And it's hard to express this love of life and that sometimes I might address as, she's my beloved woman. But on, a, but on a person trying to find this language that, that I'm feeling Henry Winston like that is that he, he takes he takes this tone that he has he he's endeared with it and he's endeared to the people that his tone that he he resonates he's saying y'all are my beloved people but y'all have been the beloved part of this land that I was born in and it's hard to bring that to a science language when I don't when I don't have I'm not wrestling with the scientific thing. I'm I'm putting those three things Tony has said, those three points of light or something that I can speak through um, in a science in a science way. Mm -hmm. But we but we talking about how we use love for each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. For 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 coming to this to the free school or something about free to me it's something about the beloved because we can't make this connection to the school of love and the school of life. If you don't want the school of love, you can't have the school of life. <laughs> so there's no need in saying that you can't broker with this, this kind of love. Yeah. Somebody yeah. has become something about the land and the people. They, they, they form a marriage. It's either heaven or earth, and then you're a shai. Because it's something, it's something between the person and the heavens that keep, that keep us rooted here. <laughs> and, you know, so so I'm not just saying I'm speaking for nothing. This is like I wouldn't even get up, you know, because it's, it's adding color to to that to the act of love yeah. and in practice and be a political person. It's a it's a real deep practice that you're not gonna get jealous about this and that because it's a very strong love that puts you in situations that. You're trying to create the love of facts and factors that give you everything you need. We're not weaponizing love, uh -huh. but we're taking the weapons from the people that have no love. <laughs> they have no ethical love. And um, yeah, I just want to say. I guess respond to some of the points that people raised um, and to also thank everybody for taking the time to think through this because I know that part of what's beautiful is that everyone has like come at it like I don't know even just like Doc's essay like people come at it in so many different ways and that's what's part of what's beautiful about this process um, and I did want to get to the question that Doc alluded to which Porta also addressed of the general and the specific <laughs> Um, but also I wanted to comment on, um, and you guys have already been saying this, but like in a time of war, in a time of suffering, in a time of great confusion, why science? Like why, why science? And part of the way that I understand this is actually there is no better time for science right. and for the seeking out of a new science than a time like this. Um, 
And yeah, I think in terms of the this question of the general and specific, part of why I feel it matters is that all of the 20, all of the revolutions of the 20th century were guided by what you would call a general theory, right? Um, which was specifically Marxism-Leninism or the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, many other revolutions around the world. Um, you could say maybe the Indian freedom movement was a slightly different, <laughs> slightly different, also the civil rights movement. But nonetheless, I think it's important if we are concerned with change and revolutionary change in this time to seek out what we would think of as a general theory. Right. Um, this is... And in that sense, there, I think there are, in this time, different ways of interpreting the role of someone like Du Bois or Winston mm -hmm. by saying, oh, like Du Bois is the American articulation or manifestation of Marxism, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think it's an interesting proposition, but part of this is just a gut feeling. But to me, the way that I relate to Du Bois is more as a general and more as a yeah. universal. Yep. And I don't know exactly why I feel that way, but it's just the way partially that I understand the world um, coming up through the ideas of the free school and stuff like yeah. that. Um, and so that's part of my question, but I also wanted to, I guess, tie it concretely to a work like Black Reconstruction, which Doc talks about in the essay, where if you were to just view Black Reconstruction in America as just Du Bois working out an American like case study of Marxism, yeah. right? <laughs> which is how I think some people view it, yeah. It would be a different, it would be a completely different book. It would not be Black Reconstruction. Yeah. And part of the reason why I say that is because there are moments, but also just stretches of, of Black Reconstruction where Du Bois is not just operating at the level of the sociological or of the Marxist or of the economic. He's operating at the level of the philosophical and the poetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like for him, there is no other way to explain the revolution that was Reconstruction without all of those different modes of being and of thinking. Um, like the moment when he talks about, like, you know, the coming of the Lord, where he says the only, like, actually, I have to quote. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking about it. But, um, so he says in chapter five, strangely enough, not as much has been said of what freedom meant to the freed, of the sudden wave of glory that rose and burst above four million people and of the echoing shout that brought joy to 400,000 fellows of African blood in the North. Can we imagine this spectacular revolution? Not, of course, unless we think of these people as human beings like ourselves. Not unless, assuming this common humanity, we conceive ourselves in a position where we are chattels and real estate, and then suddenly in a night become thenceforward and forever free. The mass of slaves, even the more intelligent ones, and certainly the great group of field hands, were in religious and hysterical fervor. This was the coming of the Lord. This was the fulfillment of prophecy and legend. It was the golden dawn after chains of a thousand years. It was everything miraculous and perfect and promising. Um, and yeah, so he talks about this like, I don't know, yeah, just this like the this dimension of the revolution. I feel like for some people, the way that Du Bois writes about this would just be seen as like window dressing, something yeah. nice that he adds on yeah. to, let's say, like the substance of it, the Marxist mm -hmm. substance of it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that, it's almost like that itself is mm -hmm. the substance. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. cannot mm -hmm. seek a way out of the crisis of this time without incorporating that into a general way of thinking about the world and knowing the world. And the last thing I wanted to add also was to the conversation about time, um, there's another passage in Black Reconstruction, which I feel like is really relevant, <laughs> where he says, um, quote, thus by singular co coincidence and for a moment, for the few years of an eternal second in a cycle of a thousand years, the orbits of two widely and utterly dissimilar economic systems coincided, and the result was a revolution so vast and portentous that few minds ever fully conceived it. For the, for the systems were these, first, that of a democracy which should, by universal suffrage, establish a dictatorship of the proletariat ending in industrial democracy, and the other, a system by which a little knot of masterful men would so organize capitalism as to bring under their control the natural resources, wealth, and industry of a vast and rich country, and through that of the world. 
For a second, for a pulse of time, these orbits crossed and coincided, but their central suns were a thousand light years apart, even though the blind and ignorant fury of the South and the complacent Philistinism of the North saw them as one. And it, it's almost like, it's like he's talking about revolution as a period of contracted time. But it's like part of the, <laughs> the confusion of that is that when t social time is contract contracted in that way, you have the present presence of two different social systems yeah. or the yes. coinciding of social systems on top of each other, which makes it difficult to understand what's actually going on. But that's part of like, but then I feel like that's also the need for like, why science? Why in this time? Because we're, we need to parse parse things out and actually see what is what is the possible like what is possible um, and what is of the old that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, these uh, investigations of time are all over the black uh, narrative. You know, uh, and I think uh, that passage you quote from Du Bois, putting the clash of the two systems of, of uh, free wage labor and slave labor, moment in time and mm -hmm. what happens as a consequence. Uh, you know, the other thing is that Du Bois writes in such an artistic, literary, metaphorical way, oh, this can't be science. Mm -hmm. This isn't the way we write science. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is the way we write science, mm -hmm. because the imaginary is working side by side mm -hmm. with the other dimensions. But, and you know, King's, King references time over and over the fierce urgency of now. Now is a concept of time. The fierce urgency of it suggesting that we can change time. The other thing is, the moral arc of history. Or the moral, yes. again, yeah, and that's, yes. well, we're, yeah, well, we're in the uh, Unitarian Church with yes. Theodore Parker. Uh, but this thing of King, where he said that we live in the colony of time, but we must aspire to the empire of eternity. And I'm not going to even try to explain it, because I don't know that I understand it fully, because it's so wrapped in deep philosophy, theology, and, and imaginary that I think we should go further into it. But to your point, I just want to do this quickly, because it is true that I have said that uh, Du Bois took a general theory of social movement, of history, and so on, that is associated with Marxism and the radical vision of the 19th century, that Du Bois is a special theory. And it was you, Jeremiah, who said, and I think you are absolutely right, that what appears as a specific theory in its greater import mm -hmm. is in fact the general theory. That Du Bois turns out to be the general theory yeah. Yeah. of the class struggle. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the theory of the general and specific theories, you know, uh, and I got this wrong, that Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, comes first. It is the specific theory, the special theory of relativity, which is the final and more developed part of his theory of relativity. In the same way that at one time, in political economy, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was viewed as the general theory of political economy. And Marx, Marxist das Kapital, was viewed as a specific theory because Marx studied the factory system and looked at things that, uh, that, um, that Adam Smith uh, looked at in passing, perhaps, such as a theory of surplus value. However, 
over the course of time and the movement of events, Marx's, Karl Marx's, quote, specific theory became now the general theory, replacing Adam Smith as the general theory. And I agree with you, Jeremiah, that as we investigate more deeply, Du Bois's theory might be the general theory. And I would just add one other aspect to it. The fact that Du Bois takes on the question of human civilization and the transition from the period of European civilizational hegemony to a new world civilization. So I would say, I think this is a very fascinating question in the history and theory of knowledge. Um, um, well, um, like before we get to the next question, I wanted to just say something because I'm trying to like, you know, tie in what you were just saying um, with response to Jeremiah's question. I think it might be. Okay. Um, yeah, like, you know, this question of the movement from the specific to the general at every stage and uh, like what I think somebody was quoting, like, you know, what Lenin says about the concrete universal having the wealth of the particular. And, you know, this is, of course, this is also what Du Bois talks about when he talks about democracy, that, you know, no, uh, like, you know, no individual knows himself but his own soul, like, you know, the, like the idea that that you, know, you have, like, if you're talking about the extent of democracy as a science, of course, the knowledge of the world is built upon like all individuals. And, and you know, that's the broad appeal of which can further democracy. But I was thinking of like how, you know, these thinkers came together and they converge on this idea of the general and the specific and like trying to think about what you say when you talk about the rational dimension that the enemies of even the rational dimension of science yes. is the positivist construal and the pragmatist rejection yes, of science. Yes, yes. And you know, I'm sorry. no, no, no. <laughs> and I was thinking that you know this question of the movement from the specific, to the, the specific to the general, uh, like the way we are talking about it is we are, like we are going in the direction of the specific. We are trying to build up the concrete. And that leads us, us to the concrete universal. And this is, you know, this is the, I feel in many ways, this is the opposite of how, uh, like, in a science, in, like, you know, the natural sciences or probably just academ in academia, science is conducted, but the movement is always from, the movement is always towards abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, this is sort of how we have all, uh, like, been trained to think of science, that the more abstract, you yeah. are like that's like that's the, the direction that a good scientist should aspire to right. and i just wanted to bring this in because it reminds me a lot of what du bois says when he um, you know when he talks about in sociology hesitant when he yeah. talks about the reason why this movement occurred that in sociology scientists had like in scientists who were like the social scientists who were jealous of the disinterestedness that you could have in the natural sciences, yeah, yeah. in order to get there, they had to move away from society. Yes. And he yes. accuses the same, like, you know, he talks about the same positivist influence, which led to this, uh, sorry, which led to, you know, this uh, movement away from, um, this movement away from the concrete universal and towards the abstract. Abstract, yes. I just wanted to, uh, like, mention it because I was trying to, like, you know, tie in what you were saying and uh, Jeremiah's question. Yeah. We can also have the next question. Go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. sorry. I was just looking. I was just reading. Sorry. I didn't do it. Um, my question. Uh, I have to get, get tissue. It kind of relates to, um, but there was a, a, I forget exactly what you two said, um, but it made me think, it, it, you were talking about the difference um, between, um, let's say, uh, Howard and, oh. Yeah, exactly. And have the HBCUs. Or no, no, no. Do it, do it, do it, do it, let's say. Oh, the HBCUs as an Ivy League institution. Right. Yeah. right. Let's say you're a scientist, for example. You know, but uh, um, there was an interesting point that because um, I was listening to the audiobook, 
of um, a black reconstruction. It's nice, got like a little free time, but uh, um, I was here because, first of all, if I may, I think what's interesting, y'all could have wrote a better introduction. Anybody in here? First of all. Second of all, just to say, there was an interesting point in there um, that kind of made me think, okay, I, I could see what he's saying. Um, and that was that. Um, And it's, it, I don't like how he put it because it was a critique of Du Bois, kind of. You're talking about David Levering Lewis's introduction? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a question, um, uh, or at least it, it, you know, it was a matter, he said there was, you know, there was no understanding of frame of reference. I think what's interesting about that, um, at least in terms of what your two are saying, because it, it, it comes to institution, in the general sense, because you can tell, uh, you know, as it was said, um, you can tell the will of the um, whatever the people, will, the will of the people, let's say, or the um, um, I don't, I forget exactly how he put it, but through the policy. Which is interesting, I think, it's especially for you know thinking about okay, well, what does the institution think? But then there's still another question. It's coming back to this thing of frame of reference. Uh, so what was interesting about the frame of reference bit is that what you're talking about is this moral question. Um, so I guess I'm, when I say when I when I was thinking about what you're saying, because you two, I don't know, went to different, I mean, went to one school or the other school. Do you know what I mean? It's a, I, I, I think it comes back to you know, Baldwin in terms of a moral choice. Because let's say, um, I am going to throw shots, but um, um, what was the professor that you, you had an argument with back in like 2016? I had a whole with a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, pick one and then, you know, yeah. that's, that's what I'm talking about. But you know, can I, can I just address Because this is a very important point, Jacob. The point that you are raising is the great difficulty of American scholars understanding Black Reconstruction in America. Exactly. And you are absolutely right. Their reference points are wrong. You got to start with the boys. You start with that. Well, in my head, yes, and I would say, yeah. yeah. Their ref and you, when you talk about David Lever and Lewis's introduction, mm -hmm. he gets it completely wrong. Completely wrong. Now, you know, I know Johan has written an article on Gerald Horn. I haven't read it, but I hope he deals with Gerald Horn's uh, getting it wrong on Black Reconstruction. And they get it wrong because the point of reference is wrong. They start with the paradigm is dust capital. And since Black Reconstruction in America is not dust capital, it is fatally flawed. <laughs> but yeah, hey, hey Jacob, and let, uh, let the next brother ask his question, but you raise a very important question. Thank you. Tony, you invited me a number of times. This time I was going to make sure I attended. Man, and thank you so and, much, and, man. And listen, and I, I'm, I'm going to speak, I, I'm not a, uh, I'm not academia. I went to school, I got a master's degree from Temple University. I'm a native Philadelphia. I'll be 70 years old December 21st if I live to see December 21st. So you and I have a lot of common because we're Philadelphians. Yes. And um, I grew up like every other black person in Philadelphia. My family started in North Philadelphia in the projects at 33rd and Diamond. Okay, there used to be projects in North Philadelphia, yep. Diamond Street. I went to the school down the street, uh, William Dick. I think you guys probably know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in kindergarten there, and they told us, you know, this old man, he played one of the ball, all that. Uh, and then we moved, we transitioned to West Philadelphia. My father was very fortunate. He came from a, a family that was, they were very well educated. Um, my father married somebody that was outside of that circle, uh, and, and that, my mother was kind of rejected because my father was part of the black intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. He went to Lincoln University. Mm -hmm. He got a scholarship for engineering. My uncle graduated from Lincoln University. He is a well-known, renowned physician. 
uh, was one of the first neurosurgeons in the United States that was black. So I come from a very checkered past of looking at the black experience. Mm -hmm. I had one side of the black experience on my father's side, they were very educated, very fair skinned. Mm -hmm. My mother's side, they were a panoply of colors from mm -hmm. being fair skinned to very dark skinned. Mm -hmm. And they were uneducated. So I grew up in I, I grew up in, 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 in a situation where um, there were two I had two personalities. I had the potato salad, fried chicken side, yeah. okay, and and the pound cake. Then I had the other side, which was classical music. Okay, my father's side. So it, it, it was very I mean, I had, I had a weird I had a weird childhood. Okay? <laughs> because my father see when I went my mother's side of the family, when you went over their house with you know the young people and their friends. They would slow dance, and you know what that was like. Yeah. My father's side was it was ballet. I'm serious, yeah. okay? And I had never saw what comes with a slow dance until I went to my, my mother's side of the family to a birthday party. But it was only confusing if the potato salad was nasty. <laughs> if the potato salad was good, <laughs> he was good. Was always good. My, my, my father's side didn't eat potato salad. And so, so I want to express this dichotomy because one of the things he confronted me in my youth was, I used to catch the 52 bus. Mm -hmm. And the 52 bus would take me through areas of great squalor, of poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm talking about seeing poverty, 50s, 60s, and say, I grew with this. And so that was all, you know, I looked at, you know, I would look at television, Leave it to Beaver, yep. Dennis the Menace. I saw these families in which, you know, you had the white patriarch. And I wanted, I wanted that. You know, you wanted to pick a fence. You wanted the dog. You know, you had Lassie. Then you had Zara. I know you guys remember Zara. You kind of wanted that. You couldn't understand why you couldn't have what you saw on television. And so you start to work. I started to work in some life about eighth grade. And I saw the poverty, and I wanted to do something about the poverty. So I decided when I went to college, I was going to be a finance major. And I majored in finance, graduated from Temple University at the top of my class, graduated with a 3.87, 3.3 overall, got accepted to law school as a walk-in, if I wanted to go. Do you remember the first dean of Temple Law School, the black guy? Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of his name. A call, it's Carl Singley. Yeah, right. Carl Singley came up to me and said, why don't you go to law school? He said, where are you going? He said, gave up. He said you can walk in. I went to the LCTs. To make a long story short, I got recruited because I, I got recruited when I came out of school. My best friends were all African. I grew up a Pan-Africanist because my father's side, they were Pan-Africanists, okay? That was the intellectual side. My mother's side of the family was a chicken. They wouldn't know a Pan-African from a, from a pan, pan anything. What, 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 the pan, you better go in the kitchen and cook. That's what a pan was. Okay? Yeah, so I decided to major in finance. And I majored in finance because I wanted to understand the beast. The beast that brought me here. And I studied finance and I graduated the top of my class. Came out of school, I was immediately recruited on Wall Street. I worked for Merrill Lynch, I worked for Morgan Stanley, I moved, I worked in London. I mean, I went, I worked, uh, I worked for the Swiss banks where I learned how to, to move money from one part of the world to another part of the world. It means ill gotten means. And I did that because I wanted to understand the mechanism. There's one thing to look at the clock. A watch. And there's another thing to know how the watch is made. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to know how the watch was made because I felt the only way I could replace that watch was to build my own watch. That's the way I look at life. So I, I started to study currencies. Okay? And I realized that when you look at a currency that we take every day, a currency is a representation of all human social behavior the transaction that society represented in a piece of paper, both ideologically and materialistically and metaphysically. Okay, that's what currency is. And the reason you can't do anything with the system because the system is in your pocket. The system is why you're here. That's why your lights are on. That's why the clothes you have on your back. And so they were very smart in creating a currency. This system will not change until you destroy your currency. I told, and I'm saying that if you take, if there's anybody here that's a banker that has worked in banking at the upper, at the upper echelons of bank, a bank teller is not a, not a freaking banker, okay? People would say, my son works, what's your son doing at the freaking bank? 
I gotta call them, he's not a freaking banker. I gotta call them, that's not a banker. The bankers are the ones that make the decision that if you open your mouth on a university, you won't get a job. That's the banker, okay? The banker's the one that decides that municipal bonds, um, we're gonna change the tax status of that bond. Mm. That's a banker, okay? The banker's the one that decides what countries go to war, what countries don't go to war. The banker decides where manufacturing is, where manufacturing will not be, okay? The, man, the banker de decides what is taught at the university. You might not believe that, but in the halls, where the foundations are, where the charities are, all the foundations and charities are controlled by the corporate capital class. The, if you read the history of foundations, the, the history of foundations was how do I take money and control the population? And I'm saying this to say this because I love you, man. You're brilliant. And I used to have these conversations. I, I had this conversation with Stokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. Kwame Torre, mm -hmm. me, and, me and Stokely Carmichael became very good friends in Africa. I met him in Africa. I told you the story how I met him. Okay? So I'm, I'm saying this that you have to realize that as a banker, okay, the only thing I'm, is, only thing I'm concerned with is controlling, is just controlling your material universe. That's all I care about. Bankers live within the material universe, and how do I move, how do I control that material universe? I don't care what, I don't care about your ideology. You can have your chat rooms, you can do whatever you want to do, as long as I control the natural resources, okay? That's the reason why you don't get to say what you want to say, because the bankers don't want free food. <laughs> the worst thing I want as a banker or people to think, are you out of your mind? If you think, you get the chance to look around and look at me. So what I do is I keep a constant distraction. It's not, it, it's, it's very simple what they do. When you understand the university, the principle, the purpose of the university is to maintain the capitalist class. That's, yeah, and I'm gonna say this to you, yeah. brother. Listen, this is brilliant. I'm glad you invited me because, <laughs> because I'm around people that have brains, mm -hmm. you know, for it. Whether I agree with everything or not, the fact that you that you make me think, and that's a, to me that's what makes us human beings. Yeah. Okay, and bankers really don't care about controlling their fear. You understand? They don't. What they care about is controlling commodities, rice, corn, copper, cotton. All wars are currency wars. The conflict with Ukraine is a currency conflict. They disguise it. It's always about currency. Whose currency will dominate the global system? That's the reason they're going after. That's the BRICS, the BRICS scares them. Mm -hmm. Russia scares them. Mm -hmm. Because what the Russians have done, the Russians have created a cleavage in the global economic monetary system. Mm -hmm. And I can't stop them because they have nuclear weapons. But Joe, wait a minute, I want you to just stay around because the next panel will get more deeply into what you're talking about. I just saw Carl and Nixon is, is come one, Is one brother from Philly to another? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm so I glad love you, brother. I love you too, man. Okay, uh, I want to. He's from New York, so we. I'm not talking about you. I want to comment on what Brother Carl had. Say, Speak into the mic, please. I want to comment on what Brother Garland said about No, I'm Wilmer. Wilmer. This is Wilmer. 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 Hey, Garland, they're calling me you, hey, man. Hey, uh, they're calling me you. I must have done something hey, right. Uh, anyway, about love, you know, and I was thinking about Henry Winston. And of course, he loved black people. He loved humanity. Speak into the mic, please, man. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Just bend down I, a little bit. I dislike to talk about love. What about, I prefer the word respect. And, and, and you, you mentioned it when you talked about Hamilton, I mean, uh, uh, James Power and Love. Uh, when you think about Henry Winston, when he was talking, when he was talking about going across the bridge to the white kids, mm -hmm. he didn't care whether they loved him. He, he wanted res respect. And that's the kind of that because before you can have love, 
you have to have respect. And that whole concept of, of when people talk about love, it, it you know, I, I, um, it gets to me sometimes because it's, it's very vague. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. But as revolutionaries, we should talk about respect. I like love, I, I, Well, yeah, people do like love, but, but out of, <laughs> but, but, but out of, out of, before you can have love, you have to have respect. And, and a person, and it, it, because I, I've talked about, I, I teach philosophy, so I talk about the idea of the concept of love. So, uh, you, that quote you talked about power. If you got power without without love and love without power, what does it mean? But I just want to want to want to want to mention that, that when we talk about love, talk about it in terms of respect and love, particularly about revolutionary power and and people and people related to each other. Uh, the other thing is uh, you were talking about time. Mm -hmm. Time is interesting. Uh, that's a very, uh, you know, Einstein, you know, when we teach philosophy, you know, does time exist? Mm -hmm. Well, Kant yeah. said that time is in us. It helps us to understand the world. Time is, where, where is time? Do you see it walking around here? It's in us, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a category of the mind that helps us to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, what, it's interesting what Pruver and uh, you're doing about philosophy of science, um, connecting it to, uh, connecting it to uh, uh, social movements. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I, I would like to explore with you guys, particularly the idea about uh, time and mm -hmm. how it fits into social yeah. movements yeah. and how it's in us. But what matters mm -hmm. is now. Because time, in some way, you know, you know, like, all right, for example, uh, when the, what is time? We think of time as a clock, but the, for example, it's, it's, right now there's a moment, but hey, that that moment's past. So, so the concept, of, in other words, now that moment's past, right? So the point I'm making, <laughs> the point I'm making is that is that what counts is really now. And time is a very uh, abstract yes. concept. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I won't, I won't, I'm not going to drag it any further, but I just want to say about respect and time. <laughs> well, and, and just, quick, just quickly to that, not to the point of time, but to the point of love and respect. Yeah. Uh, I've said for a very long time that I believe one of our serious, serious problems, uh, damn near since we've been brought to this country, we have spent an inordinate amount of time mm -hmm. uh, trying to be loved, yes. and we have spent hardly any amount of time wanting to be respected, let alone being feared. And I'll say this in a, and you know, call me anti-Semitic if you want to, but well, I call the, you that. <laughs> but the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Protestants in, in this country that to a great degree run the country, they don't love Jewish people in this country. To a great degree, they fear them and they fear their power. And hence, they are able to find a common ground and engage in a relationship that is beneficial to both sides. But you know, history is replete with uh, presidents being anti-Semitic and saying all kinds of things. That it, and again, they don't, they don't love them, they respect them. And if we were able to achieve any modicum of that level of respect, let alone fear, our circumstance, our plight in this country would be totally different. Uh, yes. Um, there's been talk about science, and there's been talk about emotion. I mean, um, morality. And um, what came to my mind is that the science in the Western world. Is comes from a part of the brain that's dealing with like 
analysis, just breaking reality into millions of particles and not having a unifying um, concept or whatever, and, and, and just creating chaos with all of these particles. Uh, then we were talking about morality. Now you have two different types of morality. You got the morality of, of commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And then you have something called intuitive morality. Intuitive morality, it's almost like uh, any situation in life, there's a most righteous response to it, but it can only be perceived intuitively. That's intuitive morality. So intuitive morality is 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 over top of this. It's much more exalted in morality of you know mm -hmm. um, commandments. In my mind, and what I was thinking about as 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 they were talking about science, and they're knee deep in science, and the questions that they were asking is that uh, it made me think of. The science, like the intellect, should be guided by a higher mind mm -hmm. or the into, I mean the, the intuition. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's not taught and developed in, in the Western world. You know what I mean? Now, all of this science and technology, if you notice, it doesn't have morality, Adam Bach. The morality, or the real morality, is an intuitive function. That's another part of the brain. Like, like it's, what's that, right brain, prefrontal lobe, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, that is what should be guiding. And that's also when the inspiration comes to push the science into new directions and what have you. And that's what, you know. So that's the kind of thing that I was thinking about, and I was really feeling what they were saying. You know what I mean? And you know, we're in a lot of trouble because of the misuse of science. We're in a lot of trouble in this world. So uh, that's all I really want to say about that because I don't really have a, <laughs> I don't have a solution for that. But I, I I think that the salvation of the world would depend on science learning or the Western world learning the significance of having the higher function of intuitive morality. It's almost like the science needs to be on the leash of intuitive morality. It's, it's, that's, that's how I'm feeling. So that's it. I want to respond to what Ransom was saying. Um, you know, because I think it's a really important point that you mentioned, and I just wanted to briefly mention because, like, what you're talking about is this idea of, of, of you know, the word they use is deconstruction of, of you know, like of science, and the like the way it proceeds is you know how you want to break down uh, like in you know, all these connections in the in like not just the ways we know but what we know, the content of it, and like you know the consequences of this is all over, like you know like in terms of fields like postmodernism and like you know post colonialism and all of that the the essential uh, like you know the essential um, purpose they serve is what you're saying is the breakdown of the connections and and as a result you know it's truth that ultimately gets lost in it i mean the the purpose they serve is to obscure imperialism and the way human beings know and like i just, I just wanted to say because the thing you were talking about this breakdown and deconstruction, it, you know, that is the purpose it serves. Uh, and, you know, that is the epistemology, I think, of Western science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Eddie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to think with you guys about this concept of science as an active endeavor for social change. Yeah. I think about it when relating it to the theory of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. How, first of all, it, I feel like it comes with a really deep philosophical perspective on what a human being is and what a human being can be. 
And then I feel like you had to have this theory of how do we make change happen through nonviolence? How, how are we going to transform other people and then transform the structure of society? I, I look at a lot of, uh, I guess, protests happening right now. People are uh, rightfully so very emotionally inflamed by things that are happening in Gaza and Palestine. And these protests, uh, even being caught up with emotion, you know, I, I do feel like a strong leadership like King can, uh, against uh, war, for example, in, in the war in Vietnam, said we're going to use nonviolence to just oppose this and also change human beings so that they are not even capable of uh, being in any way associated or part of something so terrible as killing the, uh, other dark people like ourselves. So, yeah, I just wanted to, I don't have any deep philosophical insights, but I wanted to hopefully explore some aspect of this with you guys. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should move toward like you know, any, um, like any concluding remarks that all of the discussants have, um, because we also have a very interesting panel coming up afterwards. So I, yeah, I, I just want to invite all of you if you have any further remarks to you know, um, like conclude because I think everything that we are talking about, we are talking about a lot of a lot of you know new threads and. I really like what uh, Wilmer was saying at the start at some point that you know this idea that we are trying to struggle with questions and like we don't have the comfort of like an easily available answers afforded to us and that is the purpose of this sound uh, So you know, in conclusion, I like, invite all of you if you have anything to add. Yes. Go ahead. I just very very what Ransom was saying, so I just wanted to respond to that. Uh, but just think about, yeah, I was just saying that uh, what he was saying about he, the human intuition, uh, like morality guiding science, but it's also related to this thing about abstraction because the way, uh, like, the way, like, we think about ropes and ropes and other scientists, like, it, it goes back to that in the way that, like, what made, he, he was looking for specific answers for his own roots. But what made him not stop there is is this thing about like morality and values. But it's it's not the separation of these values from human action, but like as something like rooted within within human action that gives meaning to what you seek and and what you seek is the truth. So I, I don't know. I feel like that's that's what he was trying to allude to, and I thought that that was yeah. I'm just going to end by touching upon what Eddie asked and then also a little bit about what White was saying, because I think they're connected. Um, I totally think that nonviolence is a science to it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's OK. Is that right? Yeah. So you know, I think nonviolence has a science associated uh, with it, which is why, you know, it's so moving for some somebody like me to read about that time and how there were actual like classes on how nonviolent action was to be carried out um, in the concrete. And I think it is it's it's sort of the science of it lies at the intersection of the moral, the rational, but also the concrete realities of human beings. And this I definitely like I can. In, in the context of the Indian struggle that makes so much sense because we are talking about a people who did not have the option at that time to, to you know, to stage a violent overthrow of uh, the colonial state. Um, and I think nonviolence is a science that is ultimately rooted in, the, in, in love. And this is where I think I'm trying to think of what Dwight was saying also because I do think that love is not vague. I think it is really a concrete concept, a, a concrete category through which to examine human relationships. And just the human, I think it's a concrete quality of the human love. And I think respect, I would say, is more of a consequence of being rooted in a philosophy yeah. that involves love. That's, that's sort of how I see it. But 
that's also why I think nonviolence is a philosophy that's rooted in love. And the other thing that I've always found so interesting is that I can't think of any other strategy which puts everybody on an equal footing. You know, if you think about the nonviolent struggle and the, it basically involves everybody, um, every man, woman, and child yeah. can be a freedom fighter in their own rights mm -hmm. through the nonviolent strategy because it's an equalizer in some ways. So I do think, I don't know if it's like, make all of it makes sense together, but I do think that when people were coming up with these new ways to involve people in a mass struggle, there is a science to it. There is a scientific method in coming up with these strategies, which should be studied more than it has mm -hmm. um, in our time. Mm -hmm. Oh, one second, you won't say anything. I can say something. Okay. Also, make this. We have two mics. No, I mean, the whole thing about science is the, and uh, what you had mentioned, Jeremiah, you said it better than me. Um, what makes the new human being idea that we talk about um, realizable is the working out of uh, the both philosophical mm -hmm. foundations of science and its applications. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in terms of democracy or the makings of the, the new democracy that that's that uh, because that's what's on my mind. Um, what is the new science or a science? Its purpose. It also deals with the new human being and what a new human being it would be in America. And I think that we're in a certain time um, that in that example that you uh, had brought out in Black Reconstruction, where there is a shifting of epochs and in shift in these motions, is there also a struggle between values of the elites and the values of the people and of civilization? And um, what was on our mind is about the development of the human being in a, in a society. And I'm taking that in a philosophical stance, in a philosophical way, because the form, the formation or the forming of a human being is both a process that happens in education mm -hmm. as well as it happens in the home mm -hmm. um, and in communities. And all of those questions meaning what makes up the things that run society or makes up the human being that also runs society is the um it, it, it is the sense of the, the uh, how do you put it i guess well the purpose or the ends that you know what a human or a person or me would have um, to do to endeavor a certain moral transformation and revolution. Um, and I think that when we're dealing with the question of science, um, we're dealing with the struggle of ideas and um, it's important that what's in my mind, or at least what's in my mind, what's important is the fact that the, I guess, categories, if I'm not sure how to put it, whether that be of science or of love, be seen as working um, with each other mm -hmm. in a dialectical process. Yes. And, uh, in the context of the historical development. Mm -hmm.
All right. Thank you, everyone. I think we are ready to um, end this discussion. It has been a wonderful uh, opportunity to have this conversation. I think for all of us. Um, I think we will talk about this for a while because these are all new ideas, as I was saying, and we are, you know, all developing it. So thank you um, to all the discussants of this round table. And um, so we're going to take a five minute break perhaps, but we're going to start the next panel titled The Crisis of Neocolonialism and an afro asian Reconstitution of the World. And, and I'll invite the panelists, um, Shantanu, um, Jahan, and Carlin Nixon, and the moderator, Samir Bhatt, um, to come and take the stage in a bit.
If everybody can take their seats, we will begin the next panel shortly. Alright, hello everybody. Thank you for staying with us this afternoon. It's my uh, deep honor actually to uh, introduce the members of this panel. Uh, I was first introduced to uh, Nixon Garland at the Rage Against the Machine protest in Washington, D.C. earlier this year. Um, the Saturday Free School uh, went together, and uh, uh, that's when I was first introduced to him. Uh, Garland is a radio host and a political anal analyst, and uh, is definitely uh, against the uh, hegemonic narrative. And uh, I also want to introduce my uh, friend, uh, Shantanu, who is a member of the Saturday Free School and a postdoctoral student in cancer biology at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, my friend Jahan Chaudhary, who is also a member of the Saturday Preschool, who I've known since uh, 2015. And he is studying uh, his PhD at Carnegie Mellon. And um, I want to begin by talking about uh, what we're going to be discussing in this panel, uh, which is uh, Henry Winston's uh, view of uh, the crisis of neocolonialism. And, um, it's important to say that Henry Winston was a product of the black proletariat and uh, he was cut from the same cloth. Uh, you know, sometimes we use the word uh, the black imaginary and uh, he was deeply imbued with that view. His work that we are celebrating uh, used his experience as part of the black proletariat and his deep study and knowledge of uh, Marxist Leninist science, as, as if you read Strategy for a Black Agenda, it's very clear. Uh, we may not have Henry Winston today to update Strategy for a Black Agenda, but we do have his method of understanding the world, right. which was right. the Black proletariat imaginary, the rational science of Marxism Leninism, and the moral imperative. Today, neocolonialism is in a deep crisis. I think, I think this has been said. But we, we, we want to talk about uh, the specifics of that crisis in the form of uh, the Palestinian struggle for national liberation and 
the war against uh, Russia in the Ukraine. The Palestinian conflict and, and the war in Russia and Ukraine are both products of the collapse of the uh, the collapse of Europe after World War II and the new world order, the world financial order that was produced as a result. The USSR defeated fascism on the battlefield and brought an end to direct colonialism, but now we are left with the challenge of neocolonialism. Israel was initially composed of Jews from Eastern Europe with a positive view of the USSR because of the role it played in ending the Holocaust. <coughs> Russian is one of the most uh, widely spoken languages in Israel. And even today, Israel has, still has friendly relations with Russia. Today, uh, you know, American politicians will often talk about the indispensable relationship that Israel has with the United States, but that's mostly a lie because after the uh, US acknowledged or recognized the state of Israel, uh, only uh, seconds later did the USSR recognize the state of Israel. It was not until uh, the Democrat Nixon uh, provided changed the, uh, the US foreign policy that the uh, US and the uh, state of Israel became close and built closer ties. The Russia-Ukraine conflict is also rooted in the post-World War II order. But these two conflicts have in common. They have accelerated the pace of the world toward the multipolar world. By taking action in Ukraine, Putin has accelerated the world toward a multipolar order and the collapse of the hegemonic unipolar power. Today, our panelists will expand upon this, and um, you know, hopefully, it'll be in the uh, the spirit of Henry Winston's Black Agenda. So, that, so thank you, and I'm excited just as much as you. Uh, first, I want to bring up Shanti. today is try and give you an overview of the rise of neocolonialism in Henry Winston's time and its current crisis in our own time. So I would like to begin by saying that the great social scientist W.E.B. Du Bois published The World in Africa in 1947, the same year India achieved freedom from the oppressive colonial British rule. Du Bois was not just writing another history of Africa, but it was questioning an entire tradition of history writing. <laughs> to understand neocolonialism, it is very important to understand what Du Bois wrote in this book and to start from the beginning, the trans transatlantic slave trade which Du Bois called the first experiment in organized modern capitalism. The cruel and inhuman trade in human flesh began because, because of the rising need for cheap labor in the white world. Skin color was used as a justification for this system of oppression and thus gave birth to a white supremacist ideology. However, as the slave industry of Spain and Portugal began to compete with England, to keep the price of slaves from falling, England realized that the slave trade had to be limited or stopped entirely. Otherwise, the whole slavery investment would crumble. And Du Bois writes in World in Africa, quote, eventually, Negro slavery and the slave trade were abandoned in favor of colonial imperialism. And England, which in the 18th century established modern slavery in America on a vast scale, appeared in the 19th century as the official emancipator of slaves and founder of a method of control of human labor and material which proved more profitable than slavery." End quote. So the slave trade was abolished in 1807 by the chief author, editor, and supporter of modern slavery, Great Britain. 
Slavery and the slave trade laid the foundation for the Western world to commence on an expedition for complete financial and ideological control over the world. What followed was the period of colonial expansion, which involved mass exploitation of labor and the plunder of natural resources from Africa, India, and several other countries. This period was marked by constant violent clashes, including the first great war, which was fought between the world superpowers for control of the world's colonies. The Russian revolution occurred under the shadow of this war as Lenin read a read, led a revolution by organizing the vanguard of the oppressed and posed the question of self-determination in our lives. War erupted again in Europe in 1939 between the same powers and assuredly for the same reasons. It took 27 million Soviet soldiers giving their lives to put an end to the fascist threat. The world was a very different place after World War II than what we know now. Europe was devastated, absolutely laid to waste. Asia, Africa, and Latin America were very, very poor, poorer than they have probably ever been in, in any point in their history. Some estimates project that Britain stole $45 trillion from India during the period of 1765 to 1938. Even more was taken from Africa. There were constant uprisings, revolts, and wars of independence during this time, which were all suppressed owing to the far superior weapons and artillery that the oppressors possessed. But the will of the people could not be suppressed. The uprisings continued till the colonies achieved their freedom. After World War II, the United States emerged as the dominant world superpower, accounting for half the world's GDP and most of the world's gold. Just like slavery was replaced by the more profitable colonial system, colonialism was replaced by economic imperialism, an imposition of monopoly capitalism on the newly independent countries, an indirect control over them using the massive system of financial institutions that the US built post-World War II, including the IMF and the World Bank. In a tiny place called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, as the war was coming to a close in 1944, the US and 44 other countries made the US dollar the world reserve currency, pegging all currencies to the US dollar and pegging the US dollar to gold. This meant that after World War II, the US dollar was as good as gold, $35 for an ounce of gold. And through this arrangement, the US has been able to use financial tactics and strategies to pressure, control, and punish foreign countries when they have deviated from doing what the US has historically wanted them to do. They took advantage of the disastrous aftermath of the war against fascism to establish a covertly fascist system of economic control of the world. This was also the period in which military alliances like NATO were established. Even though NATO was supposed to be a collective security system where the member nations defend each other from third party attacks, NATO has been nothing more than an arm of imperialism, being the aggressor throughout most of him, throughout most of history, excuse me. Whether it be the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the intervention in, uh, in Libya or the Syrian civil war, NATO and its members have twisted narratives and waged war on large parts of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Its complicity in the recent Russia-Ukraine war is also an example of how it has always been a weapon that the US and its allies used to further the neo-colonialist motives. Henry Winston grew up observing and constantly learning from all these world events. He witnessed the birth of neo-colonialism and saw the world split up into the monopoly capitalist and the socialist world order. He was a committed Marxist-Leninist and believed the Soviet Union to be a force for peace and indeed, the Soviet Union aided several countries in Africa and Asia to attain independence. He wrote, quote, today, most of the peoples of Africa have entered the second stage of their struggle against imperialism and colonial enslavement. This new stage in which the countries that had won formal political independence would soon find themselves confronted with new forms of neo-colonialist imperialist penetration was ushered in with the overthrow of Nkrumah by international capital and its accomplices, who are to be found wherever a struggle for liberation from race, class, and national oppression and exploitation exists." End quote. He was deeply involved 
in the struggle for democracy in the United States and believed like King that the struggle at home was intricately linked to the struggle abroad. He believed that the only way to combat monopoly capitalism and achieve socialism for the masses was for workers to unite across the color line and have a vision for a future and an economy based on peace. Being influenced by Du Bois as well as Lenin, he saw through the machinations of the ruling elite in the establishment of differences on the basis of skin color. Quote, differences in skin color are used by monopoly capital to create and perpetuate division between the white majority and the black minority in the United States. A division that originated not in differences of skin color, but from a different system, slavery, which was grafted on to a rising capitalist system, end quote. He called the ruling class monopolists colorblind who exploited differences in color to blind the oppressed to their common class interests, which imperatively calls for unity against imperialism. Historic figures like the president of the World Peace Council, Romesh Chandra, joined hands with Winston in this fight against the ruling class of this country, which was essentially the ruling class of the whole world. Romesh believed that racism was synonymous with war, in a world conference for the eradication of racism and racial discrimination, he said, quote, there cannot be peace in the world. There can be no defeat of the makers of war, of those who threaten peace, unless we eliminate a vital element of the preparation of war, racism and racial discrimination, end quote. When the US was training soldiers to fight in the Vietnam War, they were taught to regard the Vietnamese people as less than animals. Now think about what Israel is doing to Gaza. Romesh was very close to Winston and shared his revolutionary and scientific views. He was attracted to the civil rights movement and grounded the world peace movement in the black proletariat. He understood that the black worker was a central category through which to understand the revolutionary process in this country. He was also close to Indira Gandhi, the tallest leader of the Indian people, who was a thorn in the side of the US imperialist regime. Indira was a leading figure of the non-aligned movement, which was a force for enduring and positive peace in the world, advocating the five principles of decolonization, development, disarmament, detente, and democratization. Indira refused to be compliant to US imperialism and their war agenda. She refused to alienate the Soviet Union and maintain peaceful relations and scientific, cultural, and economic cooperation with them. The bond that was forged between India and the Soviet Union is still exhibited in the consciousness of Indians today. After several failed attempts at removing her from power by spreading false propaganda and financing opposition parties to defeat her in elections, they had to assassinate her. Just like they did Martin Luther King, just like they did Patrice Lumumba, mm -hmm. just like they did Marian Nguabe and so many others. Mm -hmm. After the creation of the CIA in the early 1950s, one can see a pattern of the US going after any nation state that sought to establish an alternate form of government that is perceived to be hostile to US corporate or geopolitical <laughs> interests. They assassinated socialist leaders in Asia and Africa supported reactionary and anti-state movements in the third world, manufactured and financed color, color revolutions to topple existing democratically elected governments, and all in the name of democracy, all in the name of shoving freedom down the throat of the unwilling masses who were too stupid to know that they were enslaved. In 1969, the global economy had grown to be quite large and there was high demand for the dollar, but there wasn't as much gold in the reserves to hold up the high value of the dollar. With the dollar being the world reserve currency, the US had low import costs, but very high export costs. America was a manufacturing economy in those times with many factories offering employment to thousands of people. The goods produced by America were admired the world over and America herself was admired for her industrial organization. The people of America lived with purpose and took pride in their work. 
When Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 1973, gold went from being $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. Inflation went up and the American people, especially the poor blacks, suffered. <clears throat> This was the first step taken towards the deindustrialization of the US economy. With export costs being as high as they were, the Nixon administration, who were also the architects of the war in Vietnam, started the process of reducing the amount of American exports to cut costs and manufacture and redirect it to the purpose of building military bases around the world. They exported their manufacturing to third world countries and exploited labor across the globe. Going off the gold standard would have been an absolutely disastrous move for the US economy, but they made a deal with Saudi Arabia, which was the world's largest producer of oil at the time, that in exchange for a security guarantee, Saudi Arabia would only sell oil to the rest of the world in dollars. This way, the US dollar would always be in high demand and maintain its hegemony as the petrodollar. The US now had the power to cut off entire countries from their fuel needs by cutting them off from the dollar. Sanctions could now be weaponized in a far more effective way. This came hand in hand with deindustrialization at home. The US shifted from a manufacturing economy to a consumerist economy, a financial economy where the stock market has more control over people's lives than they themselves. Factories in the US were shut down, displacing workers and eroding their lives of that sense of pride and purpose. You can go around Philadelphia right now and find the hollow empty husks of these factories left abandoned for decades. The ruling class robbed the people of their livelihood and replaced it with drugs. Substance abuse reached its absolute peak in the late 1970s. This is where the dissatisfaction of the working class as a whole, both black and white, became embedded in the collective consciousness of the people. They began to realize that the US state does not represent the interests of the people and instead relied on their degradation to carry out, carry out its neo-colonialist schemes. The Soviet Union, of course, was painted as a threat to democracy and Winston and the Communist Party were viciously persecuted for their vehement opposition to these decisions made by the US, which clearly went against the class interests of all workers, white and black. The Cold War McCarthy era constituted an assault on the people and their minds. The propaganda was widespread and the very mention of communism in a positive light was enough to indict you and put you in prison. Figures like Paul Robeson and Du Bois had their passport confiscated because they traveled the world with a message of peace and unity. All of this to protect the idea that free market capitalism was the greatest economic system in the world, and any threat to it constituted a threat to our very survival, that it was synonymous with democracy, liberty, and freedom. Anything else was authoritarian and had to be beaten into submission through sanctions and war. The position of what de Gaulle called exorbitant privilege that the dollar allowed the US to enjoy, to remain in a dominant position of power for the entire second, second half of the 20th century. After the Soviet Union fell in 1991, something that Henry Winston could never have imagined happening, the American path to monopoly capitalism and world imperialism was clear. The US began to spend freely and recklessly and made several bad financial decisions, 800 of them in fact. The fiscal excess got worse over time and soon America changed from being a global creditor to a global debtor. The only thing holding them up was the demand for the US dollar. Every international trade, every transaction was either happening in dollars or at least in part through an American financial institution, which gave them the power to manipulate markets and stay afloat. As a result of deficit spending and several other reasons, we were witness to the financial crisis of 2008, the greatest economic breakdown since the Great Depression of 1929. Du Bois tells us that, quote, the war did not cause the Great Depression. Uh, it was the reasons behind the Great Depression that caused the war and will again. His words turned out to be prophetic. 
The U.S. in trying to maintain its economic and military dominance over the world caused the financial crisis, and that has also led to multiple wars in the Middle East and Asia under the false pretext of humanitarianism. One of the recent serious threats to U.S. dollar hegemony came when the leader of the Libyan revolution, Muammar al-Gaddafi, wanted to introduce a new currency, the gold dinar, as a substitute for the U.S. dollar when trading with Africa. This currency would be a gold-backed currency and would eliminate the dependency of Africa on the U.S. dollar. This meant that the enormous benefit that the U.S. was reaping from African trade would vanish overnight. In 2011, a multi-state NATO-led military coalition invaded Libya with the alleged reason being intervention in a civil war, which they themselves instigated by funding reactionary militant forces, and Gaddafi was brutally assassinated. He had to be made an example out of. NATO shattered the country and plunged it into a prolonged civil war whose disastrous consequences we are still witnessing today. The recent flood in eastern Libya, which claimed the lives of 6,000 people, can be traced back to this moment in history. NATO, Barack Obama, and the Congressional War Caucus all have blood on their hands. Neocolonialism, war, and the dollar hegemony. These are the three main branches of the tree of the US world order, with its roots in racism and moral bankruptcy. Yes. The time has come for us to cut it down yes. with the quickness. <laughs> <laughs> The world has had enough. We can see collective humanity rising up against the U US imperialist regime and saying, as King said, we are not going to study war no more. We can clearly see the shift. 85% of the world population did not support sanctions against Russia in the recent crisis in Ukraine. The US has prolonged the, this war in Ukraine for so long, hoping that this will isolate Russia and make the rest of the world dependent on the US oil and the US dollar. But this has backfired on them. On the contrary, new alliances based on a peace economy have formed between Iran, China, Russia, and other BRICS countries. Even Saudi Arabia has turned away from the US and chosen to join BRICS. Currently, 29% of the world's GDP is under sanctions by the US, including Russia and Iran. How long can they keep this up? The neo-colonial world order is crumbling. A new basis for the political and ideological relationships between nations and a new peace movement must take its place. We need to look towards rising China, while the US has historically exchanged oil for weapons, ammunition, and the establishment of military bases, China is exchanging oil for development. They are investing in African countries, building up their infrastructure, supporting their striving to develop along their own civilizational values, and bringing forth a new epoch where there will be peace and mutual cooperation between all countries. Russia is also following this route investing in countries like Bangladesh to build nuclear power plants, which will not be used to make nuclear weapons, but bring light to even the darkest corners of the country and power its economy. This is a time ripe for social change. We need to unite, join hands, and work towards a future so that the next generation can live in a world free of war and exploitation. As Winston said, in all things purely social, we can be as separate as the five fingers, and yet one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. Thank you. Just a second here, let me get my, my time correct. I don't want to do it so long. <laughs> There we go. Hello, uh, my name is Garland Nixon. For those of you who haven't met me and heard, heard from me, I'm from uh, Maryland. Um, I think when we talk about um, 
colonialism, when we talk about imperialism and empire, it's important to look at the form of imperialism and colonialism that we're looking at now. I think, um, and, and, and this will eventually, hopefully, lead us to Israel, the, the Israeli conflict. John C. Calhoun, um, the uh, infamous former vice president of the United States and pro-slavery South Carolina senator was talking about, you know, we're going to add some part of Mexico. And one of the things that he made clear, well, we want the northern parts because there's brown people. He didn't say it like that. I'm saying that. But he said the non, we don't want the, we want to bring more land into the union, but not more non-Caucasian people. That was, an, that was the issue. And it's important to think about that in the context of the, the modern empire, the, the U.S. empire, because the U.S. empire now wants domination over the world. Right. We're kind of the, the U.S. empire is at war with modernity. The world is changing. There are rising powers and the U.S. is in at war with that change, at war with modernity. When people say we're at war all over the place, and they start naming the places. It's because the world is changing and we're trying to stop that that change. One of the issues when you are an empire, when you are a remote empire, right, the U.S., our it's been said about the U.S. that it is a country with um, uh, unimportant powers to the north and south and fish to the east and west, right? We're a long ways from everyone, which is, has a great advantage in that it's hard for people to attack you. But if you're an empire, it has a great disadvantage because it makes it more difficult to project your imperial and colonial power around the world. So the question becomes, how do you do that? And I think I'm not going to get into all of that, but one of the best ways to understand the U.S. empire is to examine the lands that the U.S. empire controls outside of the 48 states. Start looking at Samoa, start looking at the history in Puerto Rico and the Philippines, etc. When you start looking at those histories, you realize that it was a bit of a pain. You know, we've got these brown people and oftentimes they don't want yellow or red people and oftentimes, oftentimes they don't want to be dominated. You have to deal with, you know, uh, pushback with military uh, issues, et cetera. Right. So I'm going to use a term. I don't know if anybody's ever used it before, but I think what the United States settled on was a, a techno imperialism, a techno colonialism. Right. When you expand and you take a colony, right, such as let's just say Germany. When you conquer a land as an empire, you put bases in that land, military bases in that land. Now, you argue that the bases are to protect that land. But as we know, in Germany and many other countries, they're not there to protect the land. They're there to control the land, to subjugate the people, etc. Right. But. If it's a, a country outside of, say, Europe, if you can't com convince the people in that, you know, falsely convince the people in that country that they have independence and sovereignty, right? If you, as long as you, 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 you can convince the people in that country that they have independence and sovereignty and they actually don't, it's pretty easy to keep the bases there and to do all the things you need to do because they think they're free and they're not really free. But of course, when you get outside of Europe, that's not going to work. The historical context of the world and of the colonialist powers out of Europe makes it clear to the people of India and Asia and Africa, et cetera, that when the people from Europe come, that they're not going to have independence and sovereignty. So now what do we do? And that's why I call this a, a techno-colonialism, a techno technological imperialism. That's what the bases are for. So now I don't have to have own the country. I don't have to run the country. I don't have to deal with the people. I don't even have to pretend about it. independence and sovereignty. I can just convince the government or overthrow the government and put in some puppets and I can have bases all over the world. And so now I can have this these uh, military advantages worldwide without actually having to have that country as a colonial part of my colonial umbrella and all of the problems that come with it. And where that doesn't work, I can build my own colonies, a floating colony, and I'll call it an aircraft carrier. And I have bases that are mobile bases that I can move all over the world. And so now we have a colonialism where I don't have to, as I say, a traditional, you know, a lot of empires would start at one spot, maybe even a city and expand out from the city, grab land, hold on to that, and they would just keep swelling out. And every time they grab land, they hold on to that and they keep swelling. Of course, eventually, 
things would go bad and they'd start shrinking again. But I don't have to worry about all of that because I have these little bases and these little colonial colonies, as it were, all over the world. And then I have 12 or 14 um, mobile colonies that I can move all over the world. Now I've got a technological um, imperialism, a technological colonialism. That brings me to Israel. I don't view Israel as a nation. I view Israel as an imperial military outpost. In that, a couple of things. Alexander Haig referred to Israel as what? Our unsinkable aircraft carrier. Recently, RFK Jr. referred to Israel as our unsinkable aircraft carrier. And what is an aircraft carrier? It's something that you use to project military power. If you listen to the people in power, they'll tell you. So they basically said, that's something that we can use conveniently in this oil rich area of the world. We've got an unsinkable aircraft carrier there and we can utilize that for power. Of course, you had the people running or running Israel, is, is Israel there, the, the, the government of Israel there, who have a little bit di a different of a, a, a colonialist mindset, but we'll get to that. So what we end up with is the United States having its, oh, let me add one other thing, Joe, Joe Biden, the, the interesting that, thing that he said about Israel was, if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to create it to address our interest in the region. They made it clear, look, we need a base there. We got a base, that's Israel. Now you can get into all of the things about the power of the people that run Israel, et cetera. But then we get back to traditional colonialism and the issue of the indigenous people in the colony. Therein lies the contradiction and the issue that we're facing today because the people in Israel, yes, you know, you, you, when you, become a, 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 a colonial power and you take over land, you have two options. You can either subjugate the people or you can annihilate the people. Those are the two options. And the Palestinians will not be subjugated. They're not going to stop fighting. So now Israel, the Israeli government, who are using a traditional colonialist par paradigm, you know, the United States has backed off, and backed off saying, we're going to be the techno, colonialist mindset. We're going to stand off back here. That's our fort. And we got our fort. We got our imperial outpost and we can use that. But you have the Israeli government there. And that's the traditional colonialist mindset saying there are indigenous people here. We have to dominate them. How do we do that? And now the U.S. is caught in that contradiction. The other the other the other contradiction that the U.S. is caught in is this the U.S. empire. And that is the modern day iteration of imperialism, one might even use the word fascism, right? And that is, how do I justify going around the world, taking other people's stuff, dominating people? Traditional fascism, you, know, you gotta give them credit, they don't make any excuses. We are superior to them, we're gonna take their stuff because we are intellectually, culturally, genetically superior to this group, so we're gonna take their stuff and unapologetic. But what we're dealing with now is this liberal interventionist version that says we're here to do good we're there because we got to help them. we've got to liberate them from a dictator we've got to bring them freedom we've got to liberate liberty we've got to help the the gay people or the women or somebody in the society so it is a version of fascism or imperialism that cloaks itself in the do-gooder philosophy we're going around the world and i believe that's mainly for internal consumption, because there's a great book that people that I would recommend called How to Hide an Empire. Some of you people here might have read it. But the important thing is that the United States has to hide from its own citizens that it's an empire. And one of the ways that it does that is by convincing the citizens that the government is going around the world to do good. And we're helping people in all of these kinds of things. Because if, as we're seeing now, when the American people start to feel economic pain, they start to question their government, as any, as any people will. They're questioning their government. What are we spending our money on? How come things aren't working out? I see all this money, and uh, I got a street full of potholes, and things aren't working so well. So the U.S. has to convince them that we're doing good, and that's why we have to go around the world and spend all of that money. And all of these things are starting to run out of gas. And, of course, 
the contradictions between the liberal interventionist fascism that says we're out to do good, the, and the, the meeting place of that, right? The interventionist fascism, we are going around the world to do good. The new colonialism that says we're going to have bases around the world and that's not going to be any trouble and we're just going to say the bases are here to be good, right? And lastly, the traditional issue of colonialism wherein the colonialist power must either subjugate or annihilate the indigenous people are all coming together at the same time in Israel. Because the US is now having difficulty convincing the American people we are there in the Middle East and in Israel to do good because the American people are seeing that what's being done is bad and that their government is behind it. A great contradiction. Well, wait a minute. And I thought we were out to stop dictators to bring freedom and goody, good things and Coca-Cola and all the things that aren't really good, but that's what we're told, right? So we're told all of that, but then we turn on TV and you're bombing and killing children and women. That doesn't make sense. And what's going on here? And so that contradiction is creating a tremendous anxiety in our society, an anger and a fury, particularly amongst the younger people who aren't as indoctrinated in the long-term concept of America's here for freedom and good things and apple pie and Chevrolet and that kinds of stuff. And I think that's where we are now. I think it is an interesting and very dangerous time, but it is a time for opportunity. I think the people, um, one of the things that has happened since October 7th is that it is now impossible for the United States now to make that liberal interventionist argument anymore. That is gone. We're going around the world to do good. It's gone at home. It's gone everywhere. Where we go from, he from here, I don't know. But I think it's critical to understand. You know, I do a radio show in Washington, D.C. Radio shows are great because it's Pacific, a WPFW. It, they're great because I like to take a lot of calls to get back the feedback. And I had a, goal, a guy that called me, I'll tell this story, this will be the end of it. A guy called me about a couple months ago, of course, I'm an independent. I don't like either of the parties. I'm far to the left, obviously, of, 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 you know, of, of, uh, of the people in power. But he called a couple weeks ago, no more than three weeks. And he said, you know, he was angry at me. And I said, why? And this was odd, an odd timing. But what he said was, I'm mad because in 2016, um, it's your fault that Trump, people like you, and your fault that Trump got in. And I said, why? He said, because you told people not to vote for Hillary. And I said, well, first of all, that's not true because I do. I would never tell anyone who to vote for. I certainly wouldn't support Hillary, but you can support anybody you want to. So he went on to say, you know, he didn't buy into that. And I was one of these bad guys who got Trump in, blah, blah, blah. I said, OK, that was about three weeks ago. Last night he called, and he was a Democrat for life, on and on and on, right? I'm a Democrat. He called into the show last night, and he called in to apologize. He called in and says, I got to apologize. I said, why? He says, I was wrong, and you're right. I said, what do you mean? And he went on to say, talk about genocide, Joe. And he went on to talk about what was happening. And it, it helped me to realize this is an enlightening time. It's waking people up to realize that they've been had, that this is something different than they thought it was. And it's a time for people in this room to be able to get the message out, to help people to understand what's going on. A lot of the uh, beliefs and the ideologies that we have have been you know, dismissed have been um, uh, you know, treated as, 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 as you know, terrible in this country. But now that we have an opportunity, now that people's eyes are being awakened, it's just like a blank slate. A person like that is looking at politics and he had his mind made up. This is the way it is. I know how it is. And now, within a couple of weeks, all that was wiped clear. So a person like that now has their eyes open and they're saying, well, I don't, I, I've been had. But what really is going on here? What really is the way forward? And I think there are people in this room that have some alternative options for the way forward that can point around the world and say, 
it's working for them over there and what we're doing isn't working. So I think we're in a, at a, at a time, I, I, you know, I always try to be confident. I feel like we'll get through this, we'll survive it. But I feel like we're at a time where people like us have an opportunity to spread the message. There are people who have open eyes and open ears and they are waiting for someone to explain what in the world this mess is. And I think there are a lot of people here that can do that. Thank you. my remarks today, I would like to discuss the crisis of neocolonialism and the Afro-Asian reconstitution of the world as a revolutionary solution. I would like to say that, uh, to begin with, to preface this, that uh, today we are discussing some very uh, interesting but very challenging concepts. So what I'm trying to present is some threads that I think will be useful uh, in our discussion and maybe we'll continue to uh, develop. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is return to the question of time uh, that was brought up in the previous panel uh, as it relates to the thought of Henry Winston and Du Bois, and then discuss some recent events that are occurring uh, nowadays, and then how all of this relates to the need for a new peace movement and a new vision of the world. So to begin with, uh, to return uh, briefly to the concept of time, uh, as Doc has established in his essay on Winston, uh, and as was discussed in the panel, figures such as Winston, such as Du Bois, and even Einstein, all had a very sophisticated understanding of time. Uh, to repeat a little bit, we are in time, time is in us, in these human relationships. Time is deeply embedded in these uh, human social relations. Great figures, whether an Einstein or a Du Bois or a King or uh, many others, are born in a historical time. And that historical time shapes the uh, kind of architecture of their actions, but their example, their impact on the consciousness of the people means that they themselves become defining forces for a new historical time. Time is indeed a measure of movement. However, bourgeois thought uh, tells us that time is merely a measurement, and often we may assume that it is merely this. Yet on further examination, we know that all units of time, such as years, for example, are not the same in their impact on humanity and history. Two respective years may both consist of 12 months quantitatively, but qualitatively, the events of human action in those months uh, and the events contained in those months mean that one year is of far greater significance than the other in terms of history. Uh, this reminds me of Len's quote, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decade happen, uh, decades happen. Certainly, the years from 2016 until now have been of greater significance than perhaps any set of years since the end of the Cold War. As our mission statement states, these have been years of tectonic shifts in the movement of humanity, in which the negative peace of a Pax Americana has become a thing of the past. Nor has the ruling class been able to govern in the old way. This is a phenomenon we have seen before uh, in human history and, of course, in U.S. history. For example, the 13 years of Martin Luther King's leadership of the civil rights movement, the third American Revolution, made rapid progress in dismantling uh, the Jim Crow regime, progress that was unimaginable in the many decades prior, was all fit into this short span of time. And uh, speaking of the ways in which this uh, black proletarian understanding of time coming from figures from Winston is sort of a universal. I'm also reminded of the work of a different figure, the uh, Indo-Islamic poet Muhammad Iqbal, who I think has a similar uh, perhaps understanding or at least a parallel. In his epic philosophical poem entitled Secrets of the Self, he speaks to a colonized people to strive to develop their selves to a level of perfection. Uh, he calls the highest stage of man the vice region of God on earth. Speaking of this stage of man and his relation to time, he writes, quote, when that bold cavalier seizes the reins, the steed of time gallops faster. Again, when that bold cavalier seizes the reins, 
the steed of time gallops faster. Later in the same poem, he writes, to a slave, time is but a chain, and he always complains against fate. To a slave, time is but a chain, and he always complains against fate. But the courage of a free man gives instructions to his fate, and the great revolutions of the world are caused by his powerful hand. A slave caught in the snare of days and nights like a bird, and the pleasure of flight is forbidden to his soul. But the quick breathing breast of a free man becomes a cage for the bird of time." End quote. I would, I would interpret these verses to say that uh, he is arguing that human beings who are willing to rise up and struggle, who are willing to claim what Reverend James Lawson has called the gift of humanity, which is really the birthright of each human being. People like this, for them, time and history is something that can be controlled and can be directed. From what I can see, this, again, is a strong parallel between the thinking of Du Bois, Winston, and the Black tradition and the broad anti-colonial struggle as it relates to time, history, and human agency. And this is very important in what we've called uh, in the free school the need for an Afro-Asian reconstitution uh, of the world, something I'll talk a bit more about uh, in a bit. But then I, I would like to discuss how this may uh, relate to current events. As my colleagues have discussed, uh, we have all seen and been outraged by the genocidal actions of the Israeli regime, backed totally by the U.S. against the people of Gaza. We have seen the unforgivable killing of children, of parents, of all kinds of civilians, continuing as we speak. However, we also saw Operation Al-Aqsa flood, which contrary to Western propaganda, was not a aimless massacre, but a serious resistance operation. So we have seen the immense suffering of the Palestinian people, but also the immense bravery. Thus, thinking of human agency and potential, it is natural to ask what motivates them? What has allowed them to struggle in the face of such cruelty, despite so many betrayals and often such difficult odds of, across at least three to four generations? Uh, and when I think of this question, of course, I think of uh, Du Bois's arguments about civilization, which we've talked about today, which uh, Winston, I think, also invokes. One point, which we have also discussed in free school, emerging from uh, the civilizations of the darker nations, is the Islamic concept of the Shaheed. I think uh, Serafina had mentioned it earlier. The Shaheed essentially is the martyr who sacrifice means he or she is not conquered by death. The interesting thing is that the Arabic word Shaheed, which is used in Islam, and the word martyr, which is used in Christianity, which emerges from ancient Greek, both have a very similar meaning. And both literally have the same meaning uh, etymologically, which is witness. Yes. Indeed, they refer to one who is a witness to the truth and is willing to stand for and sacrifice everything for the truth. So contrary to Western propagandists who wish to portray Palestinians and uh, other Muslims resisting imperialism as fanatics, who wish to be martyred solely to gain paradise in the next life, I think that the Shaheeds and martyrs of Palestine are witnesses to the truth for the whole world, the truth that there is a better way for humanity to, to live, but that it will require immense sacrifice. Uh, the Shaheeds and their people believe in a future worth fighting for. Indeed, this is something that we've seen throughout the anti-colonial struggle. However, it is the West, Western civilization, and indeed uh, we can say Western philosophy and thought that has discarded this concept of fighting for the future and believes only in consumerism and an immense fear of death and any form of suffering. Yet this concept of sacrifice remains part and parcel of civilizations of Africa and Asia. Of course, when we see the uh, Shaheeds of Palestine, we cannot forget the martyrs of our third American revolution. Those who've struggled to make this a democratic society and provide us a vision to move forward. Of course, foremost among this large list would be uh, Martin Luther King Jr. But as we discussed today, uh, perhaps Winston, who lost his eyesight and eventually his life due to a tumor he developed during imprisonment, perhaps he also belongs in this category of martyrs and witnesses. And it's, that is one major reason he still remains uh, relevant for us today. Yeah. And the war waged by the US government against the civil rights movement, against uh, Winston and other black freedom fighters was horrific, just as the war waged by Israel 
and the West against the Palestinians is indeed a genocide, but it is also what we have called a civilization war to wipe out the Palestinian people and their civilization, as well as to wage a broader war on Arab and Muslim civilization. This is a crime uh, emerging from the worst parts of the global color line and white supremacy, a crime against humanity. But I think perhaps we can also say a, a crime against time and history, yeah. for it is attempting to wipe out a civilization built over millennia, the labors of countless people. And uh, it, it's truly a horrific thing, but the category of time here uh, applies as well. And so as I'm, I'm trying to argue that the struggle of the Palestinians is related to the historical and social dimension of time. It is a challenge to the notion that the West can erase an entire people from uh, the pages of history. And it is a call for uh, Palestinian people, but really all of humanity to be agents in a new epoch. It is a call to humanity's collective conscience, vital to fulfilling the anti-colonial movement. And of course, we cannot see the Palestinian uh, struggle and what is happening in Gaza now in isolation. Uh, there has been the broader uh, struggle for a sovereign and independent West Asia, which we've seen in the axis of resistance fighting in Lebanon, uh, Yemen, Iraq, Iran. And that is all what is creating a immense uh, resistance to US imperialism and Zionism uh, right now. And it is, I think, a great testament to a growing consciousness of a new Afro-Asiatic resistance, uh, which is emerging. And we see this in all of the nations uh, in Latin America, and now even Africa that are recalling their ambassadors from Israel, uh, from the liberation forces uh, in Yemen, uh, declaring war on Israel in solidarity with the Palestinians and uh, many other things that are happening. Uh, and this struggle is very much uh, something ongoing and is tied up with the overall crisis of neocolonialism. Uh, now turning to some other uh, developments, so uh, of course, as was mentioned, the Ukraine war is a, a major uh, event that's been happening the past two years, and the fact that uh, the major states of Asia and Africa have refused to support the UN General Assembly resolution in 2022 condemning Russia was a major development showing resistance to US imperialism. Similarly, the uh, UN General Assembly resolution recently to force Israel into ceasefire saw the world's majority voting in favor of a ceasefire and the US and Israeli ambassadors uh, isolated and actually quite hysterical if you've seen the footage. Similarly, we saw the uh, BRICS summit in Johannesburg uh, this past summer that uh, had a resolution to dramatically expand BRICS into BRICS plus with several new uh, resource rich nations from West Africa, the African continent and Latin America, and it moved towards de-dollarization uh, following the history that Shantanu laid out. Um, yet at the same time, while we have seen this economic growth and economic rise in Asia and some assertiveness, still we can see certain uh, weaknesses and contradictions. And I think this uh, Palestinian issue has put some of those to the fore because there are some countries that are taking a moral stand in the tradition of Bandung and the non-aligned movement and the anti-colonial movement and some which seem to be more interested in neutrality and development. Similarly, uh, at the same time as these events have been happening, I won't go into detail, but we all I think are familiar with the rising populist movement in the United States and the presidential candidates resisting the US elites. However, at the same time as this positive development has been happening domestically with a crisis of the US state, the issue of Palestine has again exposed significant moral weaknesses, the failure of many of these candidates to take a strong stand. And I think this illustrates that while objective conditions are becoming very favorable, we must reiterate what Free School has called for, the struggle for a new American people as tied to an Afro-Asian reconstitution of the world order. And in both, we are very indebted to the martyrs of the black freedom struggle and the anti-colonial movement. We also have the concept of the black proletariat as a basis to understand the masses of the world that are yellow, black, and brown. From King, we have a vision of the beloved community of an America that can truly be revolutionary and connect uh, with the revolutionary forces of the world in solidarity. The anti-colonial struggles and civilizations of the darker peoples provide a human vision to transcend the vision of Europe for a new world order. This provides a basis for new institutions, new frameworks for a just world. Again, the economic rise of Asia is necessary, but not sufficient. A great ideological struggle has begun, but we must ensure that it is seen to its completion. 
And I, I would suggest, uh, as, I, as we, I think, all try to understand and develop what this Afro-Asian reconstitution means, is that, of course, we have to turn to philosophy and science and the need to uh, fully develop a anti-colonial and pro-freedom uh, understanding of philosophy and science. Um, of course, uh, we know about the European Enlightenment and its achievements, but as I've been stating, we live in the aftermath of the anti-colonial movement, which provided its own philosophy and its own science, which we've discussed today, in the example of people like Winston and Du Bois, but also many figures from throughout the darker nations in Asia and Africa. And this entire generation, this entire body of work, which I, you, you know, one can call the anti-colonial school of thought or philosophy or the black freedom struggle school of thought or philosophy, sought to synthesize the ra uh, achievements of the radical wing of the enlightenment with the values of the civilizations of Africa and Asia. And uh, I would propose, I think that the need of our time is to recognize this revolutionary body of knowledge as central to say that it is at least the uh, equivalent of the Enlightenment and needs to be the center of study for all of humanity. And indeed, I think we can go further and say that it has already achieved much something much greater than the Enlightenment, in raising up billions of people out of poverty, ignorance, and slavery, and has still not exhausted its full potential. And the need is to build uh, new institutions, new frameworks, uh, new schools, new ways of thinking on this uh, great philosophy of freedom. And I would just end by saying that this must also be the basis for a new peace movement in this country, which must speak to the needs of our people, must be rooted in the thinking of figures like uh, Du Bois, Winston, and King, who provide us a way to understand the world anti-colonial movement that provide the foundations of a peace industrial economy for the working class as a whole. And this indeed is the basis for the struggle to democratize the world order and to move forward in this great uh, understanding of time into a new epoch. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I can say personally, my understanding of neocolonialism has been uh, deepened. Uh, Let's, let's continue that train. We have 40 minutes for questions and answers if you if you want to line up in the middle. Does anyone have any questions? I, I, I wanted to say uh, personally to something Garland you said about uh, studying the history of America's, uh, what would you call them, territories that uh, I had a very progressive education. My, my history class, we used Howard Zinn's textbook. Wow. People of America, and uh, you know, my education was the best education that money could buy. But, um, but uh, I did not know that the attack on Pearl, Her Pearl Harbor uh, also included uh, America's Pacific territories, and that people in the Philippines died. And uh, you know, to this day, we don't discuss uh, those attacks and how Filipino people died and. Um, they're not they're not considered human in our in our history. But all right, Mohammed, if you wanna. Yeah. Uh, so this is mostly a question for Garland, but honestly, for anybody who wants to chime in, I live with a lot of young people on the internet, and I do also get the sense that this is the first time that I personally felt the narrative shifting away from the traditional science narrative. And a bunch of friends and I were talking about this a few days ago online, and we were like, it seems that a big part of it is that the youth are just sourcing their info from non-traditional sources, like, I don't know, TikTok or IG or whatever. Like, I wanted to know if anybody had any thoughts on that, if y'all know the same thing, what might that mean for the future of how information gets shared, I guess. Um. Well, you know, and I think that, that 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 your comment, you know, pretty much spoke for itself in that, you know, if we look at the numbers now, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, et cetera, the people are leaving um, because they're getting the same thing, regardless of which of the, the options that they choose. And people are starting to recognize that there are um, alternative media sources um, available that are much more interesting. You know, it's not just that the um, 
the, the information that people are getting from the mainstream media is uniform. It's that it's actually boring. You know, I am um, a person I spent many years, I'm good, years, you know, 10 years at Fox News. And what I found was that the people that worked there were the sons and daughters of the top 1%, that the people who worked there, the producers, a lot of people that worked there, it was, it was something, you know, it, it, in their class. It was a good place to have a job. They didn't really need the money. And you heard the producers talking about, well, you know, I think I'm going to stay at my dad's house in Los Angeles this month. What are you going to do? So the, the, the people there are so out of touch with the average working class, you know, working poor or poor person these days that they can't adequately communicate with us. And that's a big part of the block. They're unable to even communicate in a language the other person that that that, that people can um, understand. And they go to alternative media and they see someone similar to them who sees the world through the similar paradigms, and it becomes more comfortable to watch. I think that's a very important um, dynamic in alternative media today. Um, I just wanted to see certainly. Um, oh wait. Could could you give me one second? Uh, I just had a very small thing to say about this, which is that these alternative forms of information, they can be really informative, like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. You have a lot of people using YouTube nowadays to get information out there. I personally, I've been listening to the Electronic Intifada about uh, the Israel and Gaza. Um, updates and you know independent media is extremely hard to sustain in today's world um, however I do have one point which I think is true because it's affected me is that things like TikTok and Instagram do severely reduce your attention span <laughs> and because you have so many, so much information. You have so much information thrown at you at, in such a short amount of time that your attention span really goes down, and it can sort of dissuade you from actually reading and learning. The, what Winston called the hunger to learn is something that you can never find from these alternative sources of uh, information and media. Um, and the other thing is that. Uh, mediums like Instagram and TikTok, they are meant to be fast. They are meant to be condensed information. It'll be like a headline, but a headline can never really encompass the nuances of an entire issue, um, which is why you have to be extremely wary of them because these things are also used. I mean, the uh, the people who are the warmongers of this country also use TikTok and Instagram to get their propaganda out there. So it's good to be critical, and you can only get that from reading from what Winston said, the primary source or the classics, or that will help you to learn how to think, and then you can parse this information in, what, in the way that you are already you know, primed to think. If I may. Yeah. And, and I also think I think it's important to delineate when you talk about our alternative news, alternative media between a TikTok or an Instagram or the say YouTube or Rumble where you can go to um, as I said, I like Syriana analysis. There is where you can go listen for 30 minutes. You can see some brilliant people, VJ Prashad, whoever, you know, uh, Giannis Varoufakis, and you can sit for an hour, a half hour, 45 minutes and hear well reasoned discussions and arguments, as opposed to, as we said, you know, the shorts where it's just, you know, 30 seconds of someone, you know, wiggling around in a tight outfit or something, which is pretty much what we get on TikTok and Instagram. So yeah, well, I, 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 I'm with you on that. And I, I would have to argue, I'm not much on the TikTok, Instagram stuff. I agree. I don't think it's good, good, maybe some good stuff there, but I do think the long and well-reasoned, the gray zone, there are a lot of things we get a lot of good stuff from. Make sure you say your name. Sure. Um, I actually have a, I have two questions, but I have a follow-up on that previous question, where it's difficult for me as a young person to find those alternative sources, because Google is all sponsored content, and so it's like you're, you're trying to parse through what's, you know, what's propaganda, what's good information, what's bad information, and I feel like 
Um, I feel like um, like like TikTok is the only place that I'm seeing like a radical like yeah. viewpoint. So, but it's like I would like to find longer form content. I would like to find you know be a better source. I would like to be more literate in seeking out these good sources. I know you've mentioned a couple, mm -hmm. but like where would you suggest? That's our first question. But, um, where would you wow. suggest to look? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're very excited. <laughs> uh, well, I won't give a long list right now. We can maybe talk after the for that. But I wanted to make a comment, to make a comment though on this point about the alternative media. I think I definitely agree that the alternative media, especially the um, better parts of it, are very good for getting essentially information that is not covered in the mainstream media, information in terms of empirical facts. But I think that one thing we talk about in the free school is that we have to differentiate and be careful about not letting the search for empirical facts turn into merely empiricism, right, in which right, we right. think that facts, only facts, can explain what is happening uh, in the world. For example, uh, I noted, and I, it's a great thing, as I think Muhammad said, that uh, among the youth and among basically progressive people, there's an outpouring of solidarity right. and anger uh, with what's happening in Palestine. But I've, I've noticed um, that there's like an overlap between those progressive people that are opposed to what Israel and the U.S. are doing in Palestine, but would be supportive of the so-called you know, Ukraine flags and this Ukrainian war effort against uh, Russia. And one way you can look at it is if they only see war and uh, you know, a strong country attacking a supposed weaker country in both situations, uh, there's kind of a weakness there. If they do not have the deeper... Uh, categories of uh, understanding, the philosophical categories that we've been kind of talking about today, right, like right. an understanding of imperialism, an understanding of the histories that these conflicts come from, uh, and an understanding of, you know, the, the context and so on. So I think that while, I, you know, alternative media is very important, and I'll be saying we're saying media, I think we're talking about reporting, alternative reporting, and even analysis is very important, but also the deep uh, study of, of, and deep political education, and reading these figures, like Winston, Du Bois, is also very important. And you know, we try some of that on the internet, but still the books, you can't get away from them. <laughs> anyway. Second question? Oh yeah, so my second question is very separate. So what is your opinion on um, China's investment in Africa from a, like a neocolonial lens? Because like my very rudimentary understanding and um, what people have commented to me and what I've like read is that um, some of the forms of like um, some of the forms of like austerity that like China is using to help develop Africa is a form of is a form of neocolonialism in its own way, um, and like loans that are being given out. And um, I know that um, China rising as a world power is um, against the American hegemony that exists, but. I, I am wary of the development of China in, in Africa. Did you like to? Oh, no. Well, uh, yeah, actually just following up from my previous comment, it's actually an interesting example of uh, you know, the point I was trying to make. Because again, similar to that situation with Ukraine and Palestine, here you can see, OK, the US is investing in Africa, and China is investing in Africa. Right. The US is giving loans, and China is giving loans. So on that level, you could say, oh, they're equivalent. But you would have to dig into a deeper understanding of, you know, the uh, the concept and definition of imperialism and neo-colonialism and arguments like, for example, a person like Du Bois makes about the darker nations and civilization to be able to distinguish. In addition to some, you know, empirical facts, of course. But in short, I would say I would strongly disagree with the notion being put forward by uh, mostly by the Western media that the Chinese uh, investments in Africa and throughout the Third World are a form of neo-colonialism. Um, because, you know, China is not being driven by uh, private banks and finance capital and is, uh, in fact, uh, helping to industrialize these nations and give them options on much fairer terms. I mean, that's my opinion. If anyone else would like to. Yeah, and I think you have to also take into context the agency of the African people and the African nations. If you look at the history of um, Western colonialism and Western um, uh, economic investment, if that's the right word we want to use in Africa, it has come with um, dominance, with forcing austerity on them, and with subjugating them, 
replacing their leaders with puppets, uh, et cetera. So the African people have a view here. If you talk to a lot of people who travel to Africa, I have some friends in Africa that I talk to normally, and their perspective is not like the West push, pushes. It's basically, we have a choice to make, to decide who we want to do business with. And when we compare the options, <laughs> the East looks a lot better than the West. And that's what I hear coming out of Africa. You know, if you're going to do business with people, everybody's trying to eat. You know, everybody's trying to make a dollar. But you you look at your options, and if one of them says, "Look, do business with us, or we'll kill you, and we'll overthrow your government, and we'll install some puppets," or there's another someone over there saying, "Well, we'll give you 60, 40. We'll take 60 and, and, and give you 40." Not saying that's what China. Even if that were the case, you're going to take the best deal, and they have the option of taking the best deal. I think that's what's what the way the Africans see it. Um, I would just like to add that if we look at things historically, um, when the U.S. colonized or you know uh, exerted a kind of neo-colonial control over Asia and Africa, um, they went in there, they established military bases, and as Gordon said, they made some of them think that okay, you are in control, but actually we're in control. Um, that's not what's happening. China has maybe one military base outside China as compared to 800 military bases of the US. And so those are the differences. You cannot equate US imperialism and neocolonialism with what Russia and Africa, uh, Russia and China are trying to do in Africa. It's because of China's history, because of Russia's history, that they have this common solidarity with Africa. And you really have to understand um, that this concept of all men are brothers, um, that is shared with uh, Chinese civilization, Russian civilization. It's a common thread. And you know, uh, while I was researching for um, my presentation, I actually found out something really interesting, which is that the BRICS nations, including China, is trying to compete with the US uh, and trying to sort of unseat the dollar as the world reserve currency. Now, China is a extremely manufactured based or manufacture focused economy, it will not get a fraction of the benefits that the US gets as the world reserve currency. But they're still trying to unseat it. Rationally, it doesn't make sense. What does China have to gain by being by having them their currency as the world reserve currency? Less than nothing. Because they're a con consumer that they're not a consumerist economy. And when you look at it from that way, you can see that facts, empiricism, rationality cannot explain what China is trying to do. That is where this, sorry, <laughs> that is where um, we have to think about it from the lens of the black proletarian imaginary. Yes. It seems irrational, but it's actually quite rational. Uh, I, I think that we have covered this today uh, in, in ways and um, yeah, it, it, it's something that you have to sort of feel development of the heart along with the mind, you know? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, uh, to make a comment because I mean, we, we talk about BRICS, we talk about Africa, we talk about China. Um, I've worked extensively in Africa. Um, is this one? Yeah, closer to the mouth, closer to the mic, please. I, I've worked extensive, extensively in Africa for over the last many years. I came out of school, worked for Merle Lynch Credit Suisse, and spent a lot of time in Africa uh, with the World Bank and IMF and had a chance to really see how these, these structures are actually um, the, the actual mechanisms of how global capitalism works. And it's not really the way that even a lot of intellectuals see it in academia. 
that's one of the things I kind of marvel at because um, global capitalism is really a black box that you can't really you, you can't see into. Um, and when you see right now, um, my argument to my, my capitalistic friends, and I work in capitalism, but I'm not a capitalist. Okay. So you have to understand ideologically, I don't agree with uh, this type of capitalism, which is parasitic. Yes. It's not uh, the way Adam Smith had discussed capitalism. Yes. Um, my, my contention is, is, and I move all my friends, is that China will become the greatest economic, uh, I'm gonna use the word empire because I don't have another word to, 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 to replace it with, but what is about to happen in the next 10 years if we don't have some kind of nuclear confrontation is to see China be a power that the West can only dream about mm -hmm. economically because of her ability to produce. The big issue, and I have friends of mine, one of my good friends, he's from India, he's a Christian, and he, you know, he's got this anathema for, for China. I don't particularly share with him, but I think that's rooted in obviously some historical reasons because of the borders. Um, which way the world turns is really dependent on China and India. They're the bulwark for what happens for the 21st century. Um, if they can somehow address these the issues that, that are between them, and I know a lot of it is, deals with land, a lot of it's cultural. Um, the, 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 the European interest, and the, the Europe, you know, when I look at the West, the United States is more than just the United States. The United States also comprises the Belgians, the Dutch, the French, because they're all part of that same collective. Mm -hmm. And they see themselves through the eyes of the of the Greek ancients. If you look at if you look, if you read Plato, you read Socrates, that's what you're seeing today being lived out. Um, how they see people. Um, and the compromise right now that I see is how if, if if I was at the table and they asked me, Joe, how do how do how do white people stay in control? Um, I would say to them is that what you have to do is make these the brick states want not to become part of bricks. <laughs> and how do you do that? You have to make them now part of your monetary empire. And how do you do that? Is that you look at the dollar, I, you know, you, everybody talks about time. Mm -hmm. yeah. The dollar is a way to compartmentalize time, space, and material. <laughs> I like that, okay? People don't realize what it is. That's why they're able to control. Because when you go to work, you, you're paid on what? How many hours you work? What do you produce? What, what is that? That's time, and that's matter, okay? And so if I can control currency, I control everything. And they understand that. At the end of World War II, with the creation of Rentwoods and the United Nations, which started as the League of Nations, that was all about control. They know they can't indefinitely control 8 billion people. They're not stupid. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the production ability. But what I can do is control time, space, and money through a currency. And when you look at right now what's going on in the world right now, you, we talk about the Chinese stock exchange, the Hong Kong stock exchange, mm -hmm. the exchange in, in India. So they've all moved to this kind of currency model. So really what we have, what they have to decide is, how do we do this? How do we pair away the rest of the nations from China and India? The Chinese and India ever get in a room together and say, look, we can control this. We don't have to really, they don't have to negotiate with anybody because now you have Russia. Russia is a, 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 is a natural, is a bank of natural resources. That's really in many ways, they have more strategic resources than Africa. 
people don't really realize how rich Russia is in natural resources. That's why they've always wanted to conquer Russia. And they always talk about, if you read some of their arguments, they said whoever controls West Asia controls the world. You've, and it, it, that's, that's true. And, and, it, and Russia knows that. And what they've done, they've made a strategic mistake. And I'm going to end it here. You gave China the biggest bank, resource bank. If you look at, if you look at it, it comes down to natural resources. The opium wars were about was a currency war. If you're Chinese, you know that it was a currency war. Because the Europeans wanted porcelain, spices, and all other commodities, and they wanted to give you a piece of paper with the picture of a sovereign on it. And you, you said, wait, wait, no, you have to give me gold. Because that's the currency, the global currency. They didn't have gold. They had burned down the black forest. There was no resources left. And so they gave you a piece of paper. You said, no, we're not going to do trading anymore. So they went and got an opium. And we know the story, how it, it, destroyed, it destroyed China. And they realized the Europeans are smart. They don't have natural resources. So they had to manufacture one. And that's, a, a, that, that, that's, per, that's paper. How much, you can always print a paper. The stock market, the, the stock market, the bond market, and the stock market is nothing but, again, an extrapolation of, of what? The dollar. And is what? The control of time, space, and material. Because that's what you work for. Stock. Because you work with a corporation now, what do they tell you? You can, get free, you can stop. Mm -hmm. So that's why I control. And I tell you, if you want to bring it into the system, you have to bring, you have to change the modality, the functionality of currency and what it represents with mankind. Mm -hmm. Because until you don't tell you don't address that, you'll have these conversations. I mean, I enjoy these conversations. They're intellectually stimulating. I became, I, I went to school to study capitalism because I wanted to get inside the belly of the beast. I said, look, I can do two things. I can look at a watch until time, but I want to learn how to make a watch so I can make it stop. Okay? You can't make the watch stop if you don't know what the mechanisms are inside the watch. And so that's the, the strategy right now for the 21st century is who's, who's going to rule. The, European, uh, the Europeans are not done yet. And the reason they're not done yet, and, and I'm going to, and you people here there from the Indian extraction, the, I told my friends from India, and please don't take this the, the wrong way. The problem with a lot of my Indian friends, they want to be European. Okay? The Chinese don't want to be European. They never did. The Chinese never looked at white people as superior to them. The Chinese always looked at themselves as superior to white people. That's why they have a wall. And that's the reason why when the white, that's the reason why they're flummoxed by China. Because you're the only dark race that didn't want to be white. What the fuck are you doing? Everybody wants to be white. The Africans want to be white. The Arabs want to be white. And the Indians want to be white. What is wrong with you? Get with the program. China says, no, we, we have a civilization state. So now when it comes down to what, 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 what my Indian brothers realize you have a civilization state. Okay, the switch has to come on. Okay, and I'm just saying this because I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in the building of beach right now. I'm involved. Have you guys heard about the Abraham Accords? Well, I'm actively involved in that. There was, there was a movie that you brothers would appreciate. It was called The Spook That Sit By The Door. I saw myself as the spook. Okay? I am the spook. There are a lot of spooks out here. Okay? I hate what's going on in America, but I'm not dumb enough to fight against that which is not ready to happen. The issue is that you have to replace the idea with an idea. So when the Gaza movement happens in America, will you be ready? Because if you don't have a solution, if you don't have an idea, you're not organized, you're going to have chaos and anarchy. You don't want that. You don't want our anarchy. And right now, we are not organized for the collapse of this, of what we call America. We might want it, but if we're not organized, what's going to come after it is going to be four more monstrous, four more dangerous than we have right now. Because what you have is a technocratic state. Police state. You see it right now with the drones. You see it right now with, look at London. London has cameras on every corner. There's only a matter of time you're going to have every, you're going to have cameras.
cameras in every corner here, and you want to have drones. This is real. Any advancement in cyber technology, you know that because you, you love military programs, so I can tell some of the things you said. We're not that far from Robocop. You might think we are, but the advances in technology, you know that you know what I'm saying is true. Anybody that knows where technology is headed, they're not that far from some type of ro ro Robocop existence for us. And that's all I wanted to say. I love you young people. I mean, but you've got to look at what you you have to look at what you're dealing with. The issue I can say to my my, my sisters and brothers from India, you need to have a conversation with the ruling class in India. Don't become European. Get your ed see one of the things I'm worried about the Chinese, they came here and got their education, but they didn't become European. My brothers and sisters from India want to be white. Okay? All right. Good. Uh, uh, the only thing I, I, I would add to that is, I think, you know, when you talk about what's happening, I think that the people, um, I think that the other rising world powers recognize this. They recognize the obvious, and that was that after World War II, um, the U.S. empire began to build an economic infrastructure throughout the world that would allow them to maintain power, World Bank, et cetera, the, the IMF, et cetera. So they built this gigantic economic infrastructure. And of course, that to some extent includes the United Nations. And one of the things that we're seeing now is this recognition that they have to build an alternative infrastructure so that not just to supplant the U.S. empire's infrastructure that's used in a coercive manner, but to give people an option so that it forces the U.S. empire to either change their infrastructure so that it is um, not a, um, a, 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 a tool of coercion, or it's going to go away when people have the options of an alternative infrastructure. So that's, I, I think, what we're seeing. And the other part of it is the UN. What we're seeing with the Russia, China, et cetera, is the recognition that this so-called rules-based international order is simply U.S. imperialism. Right. Exactly. There is none. There, right. There is none because it's just a euphemism for U.S. imperialism. And that they're pushing, OK, we're going to say international law. And now we're going to make it clear to the world international law is in opposition to the rules-based international order. Again, they're giving people an option to see the difference between the two, give people an option to make a choice, knowing that people are going to go, that countries of the world who have suffered imperialism for so many years are going to make the obvious choice. Wow. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief comment. Of course, I agree with uh, pretty much that analysis of the world situation. But I would just like to emphasize again uh, the spirit of this event, uh, of course, the role of the West and the role of other states resisting the West, but also the role of human agency and human capacity in the United States, but in Asia and Africa throughout the world. And I think uh, with that question, what is very important is the history of the peace movement, which you know, Shantanu touched on a bit. and. Uh, which was a great movement to mobilize the people against these systems of oppression and in support of progressive policies of progressive uh, states. And it's, of course, its vision has been uh, unfulfilled, but that is something we must return to. And there are many names associated with that. Of course, in the US, Martin Luther King, as Shantu mentioned from India, Romesh Chandra. And I would like to say, of course, on this thing of uh, India, China, of course, both have had great uh, revolutions and movements against colonialism. In some ways, they've had a different uh, divergent histories even under colonialism. I mean, China was not really uh, colonized to the extent that India was with the destruction of the uh, previous kingdoms and the imposition of English education. Uh, and it is, of course, true that in China, they don't have that system. But on the other hand, tied up with the peace movement, the fact that uh, Indians have been so exposed to Western education has also given some people certain strengths in understanding Western philosophy. I mean, the uh, Gandhi and the development of revolutionary nonviolence, which is so important for Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, was based on his uh, interaction and study of Western philosophy and then ultimate rejection of that philosophy, but the mastery of that philosophy. Similarly, the poet philosopher that I was I had quoted Iqbal also spent many years studying German philosophy. Uh, but but ultimately said that in this philosophy one must master 
accept the progressive parts but reject its superiority. And I think that is still an important uh, model that we have before us. That's certainly the model that a figure like King uh, engaged in. And that was very important for the uh, peace movement. But of course, there has to be a, a rejection of the middle class turning to, uh, you know, wanting to be European or Western. And uh, there has to be, and there has to be peace between these countries, whether India, China, of course, the, between the 54 countries of Africa, there has to be peace and unity. And even in uh, West Asia, the so-called Middle East, there's 20 some countries that are very resource rich for fighting with each other. There must be peace and unity. And of course, the role of the American people in, in uh, opposing this, this rule of the dollar and rule of Wall Street is uh, in the benefit of the best interest of the American people as well. So in relation to what you're talking about, how do, thinking about organization, how do we organize? Um, thinking about uh, chapter three in Strategy for a Black Agenda, uh, Winston is critiquing Imamu Baraka's Pan-Africanism, and he's talking about how he, uh, Baraka is excluding the working class, and Winston is saying, um, uh, right here, his approach not only limits the great strategic battlegrounds of the South, but excludes the working class as the vital force for achieving black independent action within a national anti-monopoly strategy. So I'm thinking about this um, with what our current economy looks like right now, which is, last time I checked, 70% service economy. Um, so in relation to how we're thinking about the American working class in solidarity with Africa, Asia, this reconfiguration, how, how can an economy that's overwhelmed by consumerism and just service work, where we really don't have much power, how do we actually practically do something? And I'm thinking about how, okay, well, it is mostly service economy here, but there is still some manufacturing. There is some, there, you know, not only that, but there's transportation, there's people making weapons. How, how are we going to convince those people to be in solidarity? Because what I'm seeing is the people that are working in those industries are turning to Trump you know, because there's nowhere else to go. Um, and they don't know about Henry Winston. And um, I don't know, I just feel like, yeah, I agree with what you were saying. Like, this is a great theoretical conversation, but how do we practically mobilize the working class, the backwards people of this country, you know, quote, backwards people, to understand that they have the power to change things and um, you know Henry's writing about it right here he says it is in such basic industries as steel rubber and auto that the class unity of black and non-black workers can become the main strength and develop the main leadership for organizing the millions of unorganized black and white southern workers and for a new national political combination strong enough to defeat reaction and the danger of fascism. Um, I, you know, I know that the economy has changed since he wrote this, but I think there's still elements that are that we can really think about. We have, we can't just let the left, the the liberal left, um, scare away all of the working class. We have to bring it back to um, something they can relate to. What would you, how, how, how? <laughs> uh, yes, well, I think, uh, uh, of course, you know, I, I think that the candidates like Trump, to some extent, the other candidates who are opposing uh, Biden are all tapping into this uh, anger of the people at deindustrialization, at endless war, poverty, 
uh, drug addiction and so on, all, uh, all forms of despair that the working class is facing. I think that, uh, of course, uh, details and tactics may need to be worked out, but I think that the most important thing is uh, the battle for ideas and returning this particular idea to your question, the struggle for a peace industrial economy, which is something that uh, King Champion, Coretta Scott King Champion, uh, Winston essentially talks about. And uh, on that point, we see, for example, um, you know, one side of the aisle is critical of the war, the, at least the voter base, the voters in the Democratic Party are critical of the U.S. support for the war in Israel and how that's impoverishing the people. And the other side is more critical of the U.S. war in Ukraine. But what can unite those two uh, anti-war uh, forces? And I think it's precisely the study of people like Winston, the principles that he presents that can ideologically uh, connect the dots and explain how both wars are enemies uh, of the poor, and that we need to work towards a peace industrial, I mean, that concept, that principle has to come, the principle of a peace industrial economy. And from that, I think we can develop the tactics and even develop the details of what that would look like in 2023, which obviously would be different than it looked like uh, in the 1970s. Um, and so, oh, yeah, so that, I mean, that's what I would say in short. Uh, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. That's a question that's often asked out of frustration, right? Oh my gosh, you know, questions such as, are things ever going to work out? You know, how do we, you know, are we just, you know, uh, wasting our time, et cetera? And I'll go back to, I remember, person who was ment mentor, I remember having that feeling and asking Paul Robeson Jr., who I was very good friends with, asking him that, you know, like, what in the world? You know, um, why, you know, do we're doing all this, we're having all these discussions, people are doing all these things, to what end? How do we make a change? And I remember what he said to me, paraphrasing, was, you do these things and the time will be right. And when the time is right, there'll be a breakthrough. I think now we are approaching this time. We're approaching the time where it will be right for people who want to hear about imperialism and colonialism. These words were you know, only spoken by a, a small few group of us 10 years ago. And now with what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in Ukraine, these words are becoming more commonplace. The time is changing. If you look at what's happening in the bond market, if you look at what's happening economically, they did not address the reality of capitalism in 2008. They just put off the inevitable and we're barreling towards another mess. When that happens, the time will be right. We don't want hard times, but hard times are fighting times. And hard times are when people start to say, what is this mess we're in and why is it here? You know, a lot of people don't realize that after 1929, there was a coalition of communists and socialists, et cetera, that uh, approached FDR. That, uh, he said, I saved capitalism because he knew things were going to go in a different direction if he didn't move in a more socialist nature. I think that we are approaching a time, and maybe it's already here, where people are going to be willing to listen out of desperation and pain. And we don't want desperation and pain, but when the time is right, the message will be heard. And I think we're getting to that time. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be concluding this panel and uh, moving towards closing remarks uh, very soon. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Closing remarks are very short. We, don't, we just wanted to thank you all for coming out today. We wanted to invite you to continue the conversation tomorrow. Same location, doors open at noon, and we'll be here until 8. So it'll be just as rich and full. And this will especially include what Jeremiah has in his hand right here, which is the launch of our journal Avant-Garde. We've seen copies of this journal floating around today, and we kept them under lock and key because we're having our big launch tomorrow. So if you want, a copy of this journal will have more tomorrow, so come at 12 okay. p.m. Uh, that's when we in lunch. Thanks. Thank you.
I don't know if you should ask.